Jake. The Jake. I think it should be Jake myself. I think Jake is the uh, the guy that runs the operations, isn't he? He knows the ins and outs of it. Uh, the you know he's the guy that could make most of the decisions and so on. The problem is he's really busy. How would you get around that? How would you mitigate the risk of being busy? Time role anyway, isn't it? It's it's a part time role, so that's yeah. one thing. You'd have to pre pre um, pre schedule the times he's going to spend with us and so on and so forth. Yeah. And maybe when he's away from his operational duties, maybe give him some support on an operational basis. Maybe get Mimi in there. So come Mimi, I know she's allergic to marmalade, but that's a bit of a red herring. We don't yeah. want to reach it, but she's working in the business. She seems to work to him. Maybe she could step up and take his role while he's there with the team. I think Jake's probably your best bet. I think Kerry, she's more customer focused, really, isn't she? She's more about the image and reputation rather than knowing the operations. Um, who else are your business advisors? Anybody else? Sam, Mimi, Kerry. You got Sam there. And did you say Kerry, Susan? That was that was me. Yeah. That was um, Marianne. Oh, Wait. sorry. Sorry, Susan. It's Marianne. Did you say Sam and Kerry? Yes. And, and, and Mimi. And Mimi, why not? Yeah, Mimi. Yeah. Anybody else? Cool. Okay. I think this is like when you see... Um, uh, we have radio shows when they say, can you play a song for my mum and my dad and everyone else who knows me? Bring in you if you like. I think people tend to leave Mimi out, but I think she's you need her because she's on the packing side. We can easily miss something there. I think Kerry would be really useful because she talks to real real customers, doesn't she, really? she And she's about image, reputation, and so on, and producing the right-looking website. And I think what I would do if I was bringing Kerry in, I'd ask her if she could actually get some team users real users to come and to come along and, and, and look at our website while it's under development and tell us what they think you know maybe act out a journey of how we're doing some marmalade and all the rest of it and i think you need to i think you need to uh, embrace Ke uh, sam as well as as you rightly said you know general all-rounder knows um, everything inside out really a bit grumpy you know um but you know people kind of like him for his grumpiness really you know they're all critical friends Sometimes better to have people inside the tent pointing out rather than outside pointing in. I think that's what I do there. So who's your project manager? We were uh, a bit split between Victor and Sanjay on this one. Sanjay and Victor? Yes. So we had a split vote there. Mm -hmm. What about the other group? Well, we're not being bold now. Can't be Sanjay. Bold. Sanjay? So we got we got one and a half votes for Sanjay. Yeah. Oh, you know, I mean, the, the thing about this is all project management is, is, is about people. Isn't it? It's about people. It's about carrying the change and getting so on and so forth. Um, I think it's Sanjay. You know, he's already got good interpersonal skills. He's on side. Uh, he's on side with the um, with the product. He loves the company. Um, he loves marmalade. People like him. He's already running a team and so on. So I think I'd go for Sanjay. Did anyone ever go for Kerry, by the way? Nobody went for Kerry? People often I did Kerry. mention Kerry, but I did mention Kerry, but the team raised that that would mean that everybody would basically be in the family. And that yeah, made sense. Oh, the family thing came through, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think the thing about people often go for Kerry that because she likes to keep everybody happy. I'm not sure that's what project managers do, to be honest. But um, yeah, but I think it's San I think I'd go for Sanjay. Um, there's a good saying in project management that you could you're never actually wrong, but you could be on a low level of correctness. I think Victor would be a low level of correctness. Yeah, because he's Mr. He's Mr. Techie, isn't he? Really, he's Mr. Techie. You know, he he he's tech core, isn't he? That, that's what was pushing it, I think, with our team in the end, is if we were, if we actually had in that list a tech coordinator, that's where I'm pretty sure that that's, that's where he'd that's where he be. Tech coordinator, even tech advisor as well, because, you know, he knows that he doesn't, he's not operational, he's more, uh, he's, he's more, he's more technical, he knows all the applications. And the other thing is something that I heard Travis say, he's a bit into the detail of life, isn't he? I'm not going to use the words that Mariana used, uh, but, you know, he likes to straighten the pictures. He's not a man for big pictures, is he, Reid? I don't mean big mm. pictures in the sense on the wall. Yeah. But he wants to get into too much detail. That's not what our project manager does. 
but um, you know, it, 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 but it's very interesting. You know, um, I would always look for a business-based project manager if I were you. If they ask you to do this as an exam, but if I work with IT software developers, they always pick Victor as a project manager. Not always, but nearly always, nearly always, pick Victor. But I it's think because it's the attention to detail. That's why. Yeah. You know, the risk. The problem is with Kerry is the risk. The risk is the fact that she wants to keep everybody happy in project yeah, management. Absolutely. You don't keep everybody happy. I think those are your best choices for business ambassadors and business advisors. But if they did this in the exam, you'd get a mark for that, a mark for that, a mark for that, and a mark for that. Just by really being guided by what it says in the manual. They probably wouldn't ask you about that. And that's how it works. So we're on the right line, sir. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave people behind now in a moment. So uh, let me just uh, share my screen just to give you some... At the end of every section, there's a sort of top tips for the project manager kind of section, um, which we uh, just want to look at quickly. So, um, yeah, let's get you out of the way here. So, tips for, for putting people into the role. Well, you know, the ambassador really is what you need. You know, their input really does drive out the right solution, and, you know, they make the majority of the business decisions. Um, this is nonsense. There should only be one sponsor and one visionary. But it can cause problems if you have projects which have multiple funding agencies involved. Like if you have local authorities which work in consortia or retail companies which work in consortia, you still need, I think, just one sponsor and one visionary. The way to do it is to run a workshop, a discussion, uh, discussing the, the uh, uh the discussing the responsibilities of each role and seeing who can who's your best fit. And, and sometimes you have to accept that some decisions will need to be escalated. And that's often true of the ambassador. You know, if you're running you know, various um, time boxes, maybe the ambassador is worried about making decisions which could affect other time boxes. So you've got an escalation route to the visionary. Um, each role should understand their responsibilities. You can be both project manager and team leader, but be aware of how people will perceive that. Testing is, uh, is embedded. Um, the tech coordinator is usually a team and the analyst is often also the team leader as well. So you can combine roles in, a, in some ways. And that's, uh, that's basically um, chapter, chapter seven, where we talked about the roles and responsibilities. Okay. So, thanks for doing that. Uh, everyone's still okay? I think you grabbed some coffee during before we started that, so I hope we can push on a little bit, to be honest. Um, and I, and I want to go back, if I can, to the idea of um, the, the process uh, and get you thinking about that again. And we're going we're gonna to hone in on a bit of detail there about that. So let, me, let me just go over in a little bit more detail what I think I've already done, to be honest. It's not a bad idea to do it again. So uh, if you look, we've got six phases in our life, life cycle. The first phase is what we call pre-project. This is where we identify who the sponsor is. And this is what we, this is what the, and they will pull together some kinds of terms of reference and define the drivers for the change. Why are we making the change? Are we trying to make money, save money? Uh, are we trying to move into a new sales environment like Miller's are? Are we trying to move into a new product set, 5G, uh, on, um, 3G, 3D printing or whatever? Then that's just enough to justify going into feasibility. Feasibility is kind of a toe in the water, really. And this is hours and days, not weeks and months. And all we ask ourselves as part of this work is, is there a feasible opportunity? In other words, we do some really ballpark figures on an outline business case. Roughly how much will it cost? Roughly how long will it take? Where do we see the risk lie and what sort of benefits do we think we might arise? But it's very much finger in the air stuff. But the other thing we need to make a decision about here 
is is agile the right approach is agile the right approach and you know we need the answers to both those questions to be yes to enable us to justify moving into foundations right and foundations is basically you know setting it up as a project and a high level scoping exercise i mean that's essentially what it is yeah and what we do here is set up what we call firm foundations so we establish quite a few things here we pull together our prioritized requirements list you're going to see one of these this afternoon for millers and this is essentially the scope of the project. If they ask you in the exam what is which what is known as the scope of the project, it's the prioritized requirements list. It is just a list of requirements which are prioritized using must, should, could, won't now. We also pull together our delivery plan, where we split our project up into increments of delivery and we allocate time boxes to at least the first increment. And we also need to think about what we generally call as a set governance. And governance defines how we're going to carry out, how we're going to carry out various aspects of the project. How are we going to manage it? In other words, this is where we establish what you've just done, roles and responsibilities, wider stakeholder engagement, how we're going to track progress and so on. We should, we should outline what sort of solution we're aiming at without going into much, in too, much to see, too much detail. So we pre produce a pretty picture of where we're going or what we intend to put in place. Some people call it a target operating model. Some people call it a, a blueprint. It's just a picture of what we're going to put in place. And we should also think about how we're going to develop the solution. How we're going to develop the solution. By which I mean, um, uh, what standards are we going to uh, build it to? How are we going to test it? What sort of quality we're going to live? We're going to deliver to? What practices we're going to use, and so on. And because we've done all this, we should now be able to come up with a more detailed, you know, if you like, a full business case for the project. And because we know more things now, we know more about the project. We should revisit this question. Is Agile still the right approach? Because what, could, what we could now think to ourselves is that now we know more about it, actually it might not be the right approach at all. You know, we could now div move into a more detailed, a more traditional approach for building a solution. And at the end of this phase, we, we have you know a, a, a pretty big decision to make, really, which if you strip it back, is basically should we go or no go into delivering the first increment? In other words, shall we shall we actually start running the project as it's set up and scoped here? And running the project is called. evolutionary development and this is where we're going to take some of our prioritized requirements into the first into the time boxes of the first increment and start you know exploring and engineering exploring the detail and engineer the solution And the idea is that we get to the end of every increment, we will deploy deploy deploy. So these are our incremental releases, and after the last deployment, we'll close the project because we are now in business as usual. So this is this is BAU. 
and these are our incremental deployments. And, and we close the project, they often ask you this in the exam, after the final deployment. In other words, after we put the final solution in. Now, if you work with IT developers at product level, this is all they want to do. They see this as often the nuisance factor of the project. You know, this is where the solution development team, this is the solution development team, you know, doing product delivery, product development. This is the bit they all want to play with. But if we don't do the earlier parts of the life cycle, then we don't really have the answers to a whole series of questions which we, which we sort out here. And there are a whole series of questions which get established and answered um, through, um, through foundations. And it's basically a setup as a project because what we basically come up with our foundations, the answers or clarity over a whole series of questions you know, we, we understand why we're doing the project. And that's because coming out of foundations, we have a, a reasonable business case. We understand who's doing what. Because coming out of foundations, we've defined our management approach. And the management approach includes roles and responsibilities. We understand what the scope of the project is and what we're aiming at. So the scope is our prioritized requirements list. Excuse the shorthand. And the other thing is, is sort of what we're, what we're trying to put in place as a, an overarching target is what we call our solution architecture. I hate the word architecture, but I'll explain what all these things are around about lunchtime. We also need to consider and have the answers to when are we going to deliver? And of course, that will be our delivery plan. And that basically says, when are we going to deliver our increments? What's the structure of our project? And we also need to agree how, okay? How we're going to control the project, how we're going to monitor progress and so on. Once again, that would be in our management approach. So that should set out how we're going to control what we're going to do, how we're going to engage with the stakeholders, and crucially, how are we going to build and test the solution? And that would be in our development approach. And the idea is if you're going to run it a project, you need the answers to all those questions. You can't run a, a project without having the answers to those questions. And it's very similar in the Prince world to pulling together a pin. And these, what we say is we start thinking about these, these questions in outline, in feasibility. So we think about them in outline and feasibility. And by the time we come up from foundations, they are firm foundations coming out of foundations. So what we're saying really is we start to think about those things here, like we have an outline business case, full business case, but by the time we come out of foundations, we have these things firmed up. So before we start running the project, everyone knows why we're doing it. Everyone knows who's doing what. Everyone knows what the scope of the project is and what we're aiming at as a solution. Everyone can see the plan. Everyone knows how we're going to control the project. Everyone knows how we're going to build and test. And these are going to be called our six foundations products. When we get into another session later on. These are established coming through coming out of foundations. 
Why are there six? Let's count them up. No particular order. One, two, three, four, five, six. And basically, they're providing the answers to those questions. And if you don't have the answers to those questions, you can't run it as a project. You have no control. We're not sure who's doing not. We're not sure what we're trying to deliver. We're not sure of a plan. We're not sure how we're going to engage with the stakeholders. How are we going to monitor progress? All of these things are set up by the time we come out of foundations. How does that grab you? Make sense? And those of you at a project level who've been through my hands on prints, it's very similar to a PID. You've got the project initiation document, gives you all that information. But there is none of this in, in product life cycle. For those of you who've been through, we all come across Scrum. You know, Scrum doesn't cover any of that. Scrum is just here, product delivery. You know, but if it's a project, you need this kind of governance arrangement around it. So does that make sense to everybody? Can I, any debate on that? Yeah, can you see what we're doing? Now the danger is you put too much detail in here. We would say that shouldn't take 10 or 15 more, about 10 or 15% of the project lifetime, because most of your work wants to be down here. But what we're doing here, if you remember this expression yesterday, is enough of design up front to be able to take things forward. Paul? Uh, you say 10 or 15% of the project lifetime, what kind of length the project is well, that? I mean, yeah, I mean, it depends on the nature of the project, but we generally talk about agile projects being three to six months. So we're talking about spending a couple of weeks on this, setting it up. But there's no reason why you can't scale agile up more than that. But we're talking about, we tend to talk about shorter projects than in a traditional approach. Yeah, so would you would you break down a project that, for example, could take one or two years into like a three month kind of I, I, I definitely look at that. I think a project. I would definitely say I'd look to break that into into a program of projects with, within a, within that time frame. I think that's too big for any project, really. Yeah. I mean, if you think of things like HS two, they're all programs, they're not projects. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we're basically we're delivering what is essentially a product, but actually it's a project because there's so much integration. You know, it's a mm -hmm. product that handles about 20 other products across you know 7,000 people platform and it's just turned into chaos mm -hmm. um, and of course the trouble is you'll then got all these other projects so the agile nature is well we're going to do this and then we'll do that so your time scale goes from well in private frankly six months the whole thing will be done yeah um, you ought to look I think you you might you might benefit Paul from looking at managing successful programs MSP yeah yeah, uh, we've talked about multimodal delivery and some projects being waterfall and some being um, the latest version anyway, some being agile and how you how you manage the dependencies between them at a strategic level. Yeah, with the, I don't know if we, maybe we cover it later, but with the foundation and the whole question of is agile the right approach, uh, are we, we going to cover how we make that decision? Or? We are, this very next session. Nice, thank you. This very next session, okay. Absolutely right, and I'm going to get you to think about it. <laughs> So how do you know? I've been very glib here. How do we make that decision? How how do we uh, how do we decide whether agile is the right approach or not? And often people say to me, "Well, we've got no choice, mate. It's been decided. Thou shalt be agile is the new religion, the new mantra." In this case, we have to say, "Okay, how do we make it work then?" And we've got a device which helps, and you'll find it at the back of the manual on page two hundred six. I can just share my screen with you a minute. And it's not a very sexy product, I'm afraid. It's called the, uh, but it's, I think it's quite useful as I think you might find out in a moment. It's called the Project Approach Questionnaire. Okay. And what you have in this is a whole series of questions. There are 17 questions, 17 questions, which we, 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 are, we ask firstly of of the appointed roles in feasibility, and then we revisit in foundations. And the idea is the project manager is responsible for seeing that this is carried out. And we take each of our 17 conditions and collectively agree whether we strongly agree with that statement through as far as strongly disagree. And where we, strong, where we have con, what you might call contra indicators, disagree or strongly disagree, then that represents a risk to Agile PM. 
And we have to think about whether we can mitigate that risk or not. What, how would we tailor Agile PM to enable us to overcome that risk? And it's a device for getting you thinking about where the risks lie. And that's what we do as part of the feasibility work. And again, at foundations, that's all it says in the manual. I'll talk a bit more about it. And it basically, it's a risk management tool. It's a tailoring tool. And the idea also is if collectively you think, you know, or none of these things are going to work in your organization, uh, maybe Agile PM ain't for you, to be honest. Uh, and that's the idea of it. That enables us to work out whether Agile PM is the right approach. And if we've already decided it's going to be the approach, how can we best tailor it and mitigate the risk of being unsuccessful? And it's called the project approach question. And I will send it to you electronically before we finish the course. And all it is is 17 conditions. Simple as that. 17 conditions. And the project manager is responsible for, for seeing that these are answered collectively in a realistic way. Um, uh, a, firstly, in feasibilities to enable that decision to be made. And we revisit it here. Okay. And it's just a tool, really. And um, I, what I encourage my clients to do is to put it on their intranet. So when they're, when they're thinking about running agile projects, um, they've got something to help them make that decision. But, but I also use it in another way. I use it, I often get asked if in organization at an enterprise level, if you like, that they're thinking of adopting agile. And I often get asked to say, OK, can you just advise on what we would need to do as an enterprise, as a, as a, as a trust, as a, as a department, as a company to introduce agile ways of working? And I would use something like this as a sort of corporate tool to get them thinking about some of the cultural aspects, get them thinking about some of the cultural aspects. Have we got clear sponsorship? Are we happy to prioritize? Um, um, are we, are we focused on on-time delivery? Um, are we happy to accept that requirements will be specified at high level and then evolve? Um, can we collaborate? All those kind of things. And these are the kind of cultural success factors that we need. And I find it a quite useful device. So what I thought I would do, it's actually on the last page of your case study document as well as in the book. It's on page 206 of the manual, but it's also in the, on the last page of the, uh, of the book. And what I was going to ask you to do, I'm going to split you into two groups. I'll be honest, now, I'm, I'm going to put all the NHS guys together uh, and all the military guys together. And, um, uh, and Courtney and Paul, I'm going to allocate you sort of one to each group. Yeah, because what I'm going to suggest, what I'm going to ask you to do, and it's only a short exercise leading up to lunch or nearly at lunch uh, because you're quite busy today. I want you to imagine that you're thinking of introducing agile ways of working into your trust into your department into your regiment into your whatever department you're in <laughs> and maybe you've already done it and all i want you to do is pick up if you can four things four of those 17 which you think would be would be would be contra indicators which you think at the moment would be you disagree with a statement or you strongly disagree and also therefore what you would do to mitigate each of those conditions does that make sense? So it's not, although it's at the back of Miller's, it's the last page of Miller's, it's also in your manual on page 206. I want you to think more, more sort of corporately, more at an enterprise level. Just pick out four of those statements and think, you know, just so you're going to have to be fairly quick on this because we're not going to allow long for it. Four of those statements and say, which of these do we think it represents a significant risk to introducing Agile PM in our enterprise and how would we mitigate those risks? So it's a, although it's in the Miller's case study document, it's a it's a it's a corporate thing. Is that okay? So I've deliberately put the NHS people together and the military people together because you get sort of cultural things in each one. So let let me just put the groups together, and I'll come and uh, sort you out. So. Uh, so to bear with me while I just fiddle around with your names for a bit.
I think that works. So we've got Alex, Dan, Lloyd, Paul, all those we've got Trevor in with it. Trevor's joined, Trevor and all those have joined the soldier. Trevor's joined the soldier, sorry. In this one we've got David, Laura, Susan, Lisa. So, so, yeah. Joining the soldiers, even though I'm NHS. Oh, you're NHS. Sorry, I got you wrong. Yeah, no, no, we're there. No. Let's, let's move that I don't way. mind. You know, it's no problem. Uh, there's something you need to be told on Thursday. I saw you. I saw you as a man in uniform. That's what it was, mate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, I got you sign you next three years of your life. Mm. Right there, we go. I think that'll work. So, in one group, we've got. I think we've got all the NHS people. Shout out if I'm wrong. We've got David, Laura, Lisa, Susan, Trevor, and. Courtney is lucky enough to be in that group. Um, in the other group, we've got Alex, Dan, Lloyd, uh, Paul, Mar so we've got we yeah we've got Mariana and uh, and Oles and Paul in that one. So we've got we've got some. I think we've got all the all the all the military in the one side. Have we not? Um, yeah, let's go with that anyway. So all I want you to do is think at an enterprise level. Just pick four things that you could uh, that would worry you about introducing Agile PM into your organizations and how would you mitigate them? And these, this is really about risk management, risk mitigation, and tailoring the use of Agile PM because any mitigation actions would need to be added into the delivery plan. So again, I'll give you a few minutes and I'll come and join you. Hey, Courtney, you're the winner. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> Is it making sense, Courtney? Can you see it working in your place? No. Oh. It wouldn't work in my business at the minute because I don't think there is really a project structure. Um, okay. So it's like absolute chaos. Uh -huh. So, so you've got to kind of get control of the projects and put boundaries around them. Maybe get some of those questions answered for each piece of work. Yeah. That's what I would do. I would get each one what you've got on your tracker and say, okay, let's have... Let's and agree on why we're doing it, what we're producing, and so on. Yeah. You've got to put that in place first. Well, thanks for coming back. I know that was difficult for people who weren't part. I know there were there was a preponderance. That's a good word, isn't it? A military in one group and a preponderance of NHS the other one. But I hope it give you some food for thought anyway. It does work best if everyone's in the same organization. But can I ask you, what, what, what do you think about this as a tool, as a device, to get you thinking about whether we're agile would work? Do you think it's a useful idea? What do you reckon? It is useful, and we've established that the military is a very complicated organization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm saying that very tactfully. Yeah, I don't really think it's useful just because I don't think it, it doesn't really give you a chance to um, address a wide variety of different places um, and different contexts. I think it you can pretty much almost in every organization write off half the list straight away probably. So I'm I'm just not sure that it's 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 the application is tricky, I think. Does it not get you thinking about whether whether culturally we're whether culturally we're, we're up to it? Whether uh, yeah. we can prioritize, whether we have clear sponsorship, whether whether we can deliver by time, whether we collaborate, aren't those the kind of things you'd want to think about if you get Agile going? Uh, yeah, I think it, it definitely gets you thinking about it. But if I, if you were to say, okay, are we going to use Agile? Let's look at all these things. You, you're probably very quickly going down such a long conversation that it's just, no, we're not, you, because it's such a long conversation. What I'm trying to suggest is if you just, if you, if you just blast an Agile without understanding those things, it ain't going to work, is it? That's, that's why I think it's worthwhile. I'll be honest with you, I disagree with you there. I think it's worthwhile to do something along these lines. Otherwise, people go, let's be agile then without really understanding the sort of 
the, 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 the as is of their situation at the moment, how are we set up at the moment? Can we collaborate? Can we share? Can we prioritize? Have we got the right tools? Have we got clear sponsorship and so on? That's why I think it's useful, but you, 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 you may well disagree, I understand. Yeah. And, and you've been doing this pre-project, is, is, yeah. Yeah, well, well, what it says in the manual, let me just tell you what it says in the manual. Let me tell you what I, well, how I would use it, because they're two different things. What it says in the manual is that this is a useful device as part of feasibility um, to get you thinking about whether Agile would work, yeah? What it then says, this is a useful device at the end of foundations to establish whether it will work. Personally, yeah, if I'm going into an organization or an organization has asked me to, um, uh, to, um, to, uh, how can I put it, to, go to, to adopt agile practices, I would do it at an enterprise level to get them thinking. But the other way I use it, if you think about what we say happens at the end, of every, uh, at the end of every time box, and at the end particularly perhaps of every increment, we have a retrospective. So I find it useful as a kind of ongoing health check of the project. And it's, funny, it's something that I, if, or something along these lines that I would use all the time. And um, sorry, let me put that right properly. And particularly at the end of every of every increment, when we have our review, when we have our retrospective, I think it's a useful device to enable us to look back as part of that retrospective of whether Agile is working okay. Are there any adjustments do we need to make for the next increment to improve as we go through? So I find it a useful sort of ongoing, if I'm honest, health check, which is what I'm suggesting I would find it useful. Because at the end of every increment, we have a retrospective, and retrospectives look back at behaviours and look forward to improve. So this would help us there. You know, you know, is the business still playing an active role? Um, are we still focusing on timely delivery rather than everything? Um, are we still collaborating? And these, to me, are the instrumental success factors. And that's why I think it's a useful device. Yeah, because it gets you thinking about whether Agile will work, will it really work, and is it still working? Yeah. Uh, that's how I use it. I've got, you know, there are various versions of this, and what I, well, I'll happily send it to you electronically. But what I encourage my clients to do is to put it on, um, you know, their, their internal systems as part of their internal um, decision making, so they can use it to say, where do we need to shore up? Where do we need to adjust Agile, uh, our practices, our, our cultures to make it work? And if they find they can't, Go to a traditional approach. So I find it quite useful personally. Did anyone else got a view on that? Is it? Yeah, I know Paul didn't agree, but is there companies that just use Agile and nothing else? Is because obviously staying transitioning and still learning sort of civilian sector. Is it? Is there uh, companies? More and more companies have adopted Agile practices, and I'm not sure they. You know, there's still silo organisations, and people don't want to share for good reasons. You know, I mean, you were talking about working in the donut. I mean, it's, it's hard to get people to share information in the donut, isn't it? You know, uh, we, the donut, by the way, is Cheltenham. Um, <laughs> it's hard to get people in clinical world sometimes to share. Yeah. You know, how do you, you know, if you want to collaborate, how do you work if you've got offshore developers um, in different countries in different time zones? You know, how do we make it work? Well, we would have to run... Uh, our, our workshops, we'd have to run our stand-ups using WebEx, using Teams, with Zoom. You know, how, do, how do we make it work? And all that kind of stuff. What if we haven't got proactive sponsorship? Well, we need to, you know, will people prioritize? Well, and it's all those kind of questions which really make it, make it, make it fail or break, really. And that's the idea of it. That's all it is. It just gets people questioning. I personally yeah. think it's a useful thing to question those cultural things before you start the project. So I would take your point there, uh, Laura, that I think it's a useful thing at an organizational level. Lloyd. Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm looking at it now and, and from my perspective, the, the, it's a great questionnaire and going through it and, and getting all those points, but should they not then also then be the, um, the next column is, is, is what are we gonna do about it? From the stage that you say you use it, 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. A template. Yeah. You'd have a, you'd have a, well, what are we going to do about it? Oh, absolutely. People develop this and, and then, then we, the, the, the next thing is what kind of response, we, I'll take your point, yeah. What kind of response would we put in place to mitigate those, those contraindicators? And of course, those responses, those risk mitigation actions would need to be added in to our delivery plan because our delivery plan should include anything like risk, risk actions and so on and so forth. I'll take your point there. It's just, this is just a sort of fairly simple device, really, to identify where the problems may lie, where the risks may lie. And, and, you know, and there's some classic ones, aren't there? Like the first one, does everyone understand the approach? Well, the answer is possibly not when you first come into an organisation. What would you do as an agile coach or as a project manager? You'd run workshops, you'd run you'd discussions, try to get people understanding the various aspects of it. You know, have we got a clear vision? If not, why not? If you take over a project midway through, what is the vision? You know, the thing about timely delivery. So we're into the first four now. Are we prepared? You know, you'd be surprised that perhaps you wouldn't be. How many people don't see that delivering on time and budget is more important than delivering everything at an indeterminate time? You know, if you slip time, you might as well not bother sometimes. I bet Mariana knows that. If you've got a, you're opening a conference or you're, you've got an advertising campaign, you've got to be on time with it. Otherwise, you, you waste all, you under, undermine the whole rationale of the project. You know, what about high level requirements? That's very difficult in the procurement there. So, you know, because people say, well, I don't, I want to see the detail before I can, you know, how do you overcome it? You know, what about if we accept in the change in requirements is a reasonable thing? What if the business doesn't want to play? How do you get Jake involved? He's really busy. And all those things, you know, I'm just throwing them in there. Um, all those things, yeah, empowerment. Oh, I don't know if we can trust our team. Well, why not? Let's make sure people understand how it works. But if you don't get those things working, you can have all these slides and all this stuff. It won't work, you know, and that's why we do it. And I take Lloyd's point, really, what the action should then be added into the plan. And it's a mechanism for, and Mariana said this in her group, for, for recognising where risks lie and how you tailor Agile PM accordingly. But if you don't get the cultural things in place, it won't work. I quite like the last one, really, 17, anything else that could blow us out of the water. I love that one. It's like security, you know, lack of tools and so on. Um, we also get uh, arguments about testing. We, are, we, we have a separate testing set environment. OK, but that should be integrated in what we're doing. It just gets you thinking, I think. But um, and I, I personally think it's a good thing. I, I, I disagree with Paul on that one, I'm afraid, um, because I think, you know, you shouldn't just run, run, let's be agile without really thinking of the implications of doing it. And I don't I think, think that, and that, I think we're dealing with that fallout at Army HQ at the moment. I, I think I came in halfway through where agile was a big thing, and and now I'm basically running scrums that aren't necessarily fit for purpose. I'd suggest. No, all right, okay. Is that because people don't understand what 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 does what the daily scrum is supposed to do, or is it be turned into a long meeting? Should be it's just not. It's just not fit for purpose. It's it's not what it's not what we do. And I, I, having gone through that list mentally now, I'm like clearly nobody went through this PAQ before they tried to implement it at, ah. at army headquarters level because it that that you could almost answer and disagree or strongly agree to each one potentially. Well, you know, it, it depends on depend on the circumstance. It's quite it's quite interesting. Well, I, I think this is a useful device tool, no more than that. I don't think it's particularly exciting. Um, but I think it's worth doing at the start of a project and also an organisation while, because I think it's the, the cultural aspect. And I don't think anyone's, I don't think people are doing it enough. I don't think people nowadays, you know, I find are not challenging Agile. You know, it's become the, the we will be agile. Yeah, do you know what that means? Uh, well, you know, you realize you're going to have to collaborate. You realize we're going to be prioritizing. You're usually going to be driving on time. We need to I go, oh, I didn't realize that. Can we not just have whiteboards? You know, no, it's not. It's much more than that. But I don't think anyone challenged the old way of doing it either. No one challenged it. You know, the number of times senior leaders have said to me, oh, we don't, it won't work here. Why not? We don't do it like that. I know, but is it working now? Well, a bit unwieldy. Maybe we can maybe we can change our practices. It's just a challenge, really. Is there is there an, is like um, is there something that's like a precursor to that? So I mean, I'm in a similar situation really to Alex, and I'm in HMRC Digital, where actually they are sometimes incredibly agile. They are delivering yeah. like the HMRC furlough system. Done well, they've won, they've won awards yeah. for the for the you know the way they do PAYE and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, they don't a lot of them don't understand agile 
the what? Agile PM is not even there, I don't think, in where I am or what I've seen so far. But I know, so the, the reason really why I say this isn't helpful is not necessarily that it's not helpful, like in a certain position. But if I put this question there in front of them now, most of it is going to be probably along the, you know, it's going to be quite a lot on the negative side. And the yeah. resistance that's going to create is going to be quite big, I, I expect. And there's a concern that... Don't you want that disruption? Um, not in not in that full list. Not in the list of seventeen questions where potentially half of it is quite negative. Because the, the thing is, okay, how are we ever going to do this? Um, and instantly, I have all of my major stakeholders say, you know, this 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 whole agile PM, we, we're not going to do it. We're going to stick to the Scrum that we do half a job of. We're going to stick to Kanban, which we kind of yeah. pinch from Scrum. And, oh, agree, yeah. And, yeah. and so. Really, I guess it's I. I'd, I'd like to have something before, almost some like kind of prep thing, icebreaker, so that before I got these seventeen questions, maybe I've got some other step to build up to the seventeen questions. Yeah. If, I mean, I mean, some of these questions are relevant to introducing Scrum as well. I mean, I, I, you know, things about empowerment, the role of the product owner, you know, driving by time, prioritizing, you know, back changing backlogs. It's the same kind of idea. Oh yeah. dear, sorry about that, Laura. Um, we'll, we'll break for lunch, so, I'll, 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 so you won't be missing much. I'll, I'll put on chat what time we're reconvening after lunch. Hope she, hope she is okay. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, some of the same things apply to any of the agile practices. I mean, Scrum, you know, empowerment of the product owner, empowerment of the team. Um, are we running daily daily scrums? Are we prioritizing? Are we running retrospectives? You know, have we got a clear vision. Yeah, back clear backlog is. But the ideas are useful, I think, I think personally. Um, and that's all they are, really. And I know I feel sorry for those who weren't part of the bigger groups there. It does work well when you're, when you're coming into a company or an enterprise, which is thinking of adopting any kind of agile practices and just saying, you know, do, do you understand, really? Because if you don't understand these factors, it's not going to work. And what this is really about, I was listening to the ones you came up with, we get consistent ones. This is about chapter five, really. If you could look at chapter five, which is page uh, uh, 24 for me, this is about what we call preparing for success. Yeah, so let me just get you there with that, preparing for success. Chapter five, page 24. Now it doesn't mean, if it doesn't matter whether you branded Agile PM or not, I think it's just Agile ways of working really, that if we don't get the instrumental success factors in place, then it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. And that's, this is really, you know, any, any, it's the risk to our JLPM really. And here we have five key instrumental success factors. Yeah, no, no more than that, five each, you know. So the first one is, you know, there's some cheesy clip art here in the avatars, you know, is everyone embracing the approach? Is everyone embracing the approach? Do we understand it? If not, what are we going to do? We have to get people on side. We have to overcome any resistance. Can we coach them through? Can we show them some success from other other, other areas? You know, um, you know. Let's get let's let's try and run workshops, discussions, and get people thinking about it. Can we put a, uh, an effective development team together? Can we get people working together? You know, um, small. You know, we the team needs to have within it all the skills to do to create the solution. Hard skills, soft skills. What about things like communication? Um, we don't like big teams. There is a foundation question which comes up, uh, which says that the ideal size of a team is seven plus or minus two. Seven plus or minus two is considered to be the ideal team. I won't go into any more than that. We can talk about dynamics if you like, but small teams. Ideally, they'd be, they'd be in the same place, but if they're not in the same place, how do we make communication work? You know, what if they're in different time zones? I've, I've run stand-ups, you know, uh, you know, in uh, with people in different countries in the middle of the night. You know, how do you make it work? Can we make it work? Where are the obstacles? We like the team to remain stable throughout the time box. Okay, now, we know people might leave and so on and so forth, but we want to think that the team at the outset, when they accept the work as realistic, then feel that they've got all the resources to do the job. And we don't, they're not allowed to swap resources in or out. You know, if they need extra resource, we can talk to the project manager, but the team should be stable. Because we think that update upsets the team dynamic. And, and there should be clear empowerment. I mean, if you think about what we're saying the team can do, 
what the team are empowered to do is work on depth and detail. What they're not empowered to do is to widen the scope of the project, of the, sorry, of the time box. So they can't add to it. They can't not deliver the mass. And um, they, 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 they can't deliver something else that wasn't asked for. So if you're asked to build a website, you can't say, well, we'll build, a, we'll build a castle instead. So what they're really empowered to do is to explore depth and detail through the time box, and they can discard coulds and shoulds. So, you know, it's important that they're clear on what their empowerment levels are, and also that the project level roles acknowledge that empowerment and let them get on with it. Yeah. Um, again, there was some there about business engagement, active and ongoing. It's a different role for the business representatives. It's a different role for the business representatives. They're not just there to sign things off and to get involved in acceptance. They are actually driving out the solution. So, you know, they've got to commit time. Jake has got a spare time to be on the team. You know, um, they need, you know, they need to be supporting the team being part of it. You know, it's their solution. It's not the developer's solution. It's the, it's the business. Um, we want to develop, develop iteratively. So we get early feedback through our time boxes. Um, we have testing integrated through. And we think it's useful to, to deliver incrementally because that should mean clear, simple, easier deployments. You don't want to wait to the end and have a big bang approach and find that all the brand stuff hits the fan at that approach and makes it difficult. We should be deploying incrementally. And also that means if we do deploy incrementally, we get early benefit realization, early return on investment. And, and the last thing in it uh, is open and honesty. You see the cheesy, cheesy clip art is windows there. You know, what we need to have is, you know, everyone needs to know what's, what's going on. You know, so trans you can only be in control if you know what's going on. So we have transparency of everything we do. And, you know, there is no hiding place in an agile project. You know, everyone should know, you know, the ways of working which have been agreed at foundations. Everyone should know the scope and the plan. Within the development team, you know, we know who's doing what, we plan our work. Um, we, we generally have got a whiteboard um, with um, a burn down chart on it. They're very useful. So at any given, any given stand up, we know what the current state of play is and we can deal with things as we go. And it's a very transparent kind of approach. And again, it's not everyone likes it. I'll be honest with you, not everyone likes it. But if we can't get those things in place, none of this will work. I mean, I can spend as much time talking about the roles and the processes as you'd like. But if people don't buy into the instrumental success factors, and if we can't get those put in place in the, uh, in, in the enterprise, it's just not going to work. And a lot of things which, which get in the way, I think, of Agile PM, and any Agile approach is really a cultural. We don't want to prioritize. Uh, we don't want to empower people. It's difficult for us to collaborate. We want everything delivered. Everything's a must. Um, it's not true, you know. And, you know, it's, you know this, I, the number of times people have said to me, I understand what you're saying, but everything here is a must. It's not. You just think it is. Um, the, the military guys may know a company called Talas, um, which is a French firm which makes lots of weaponry and other things for the, uh, uh, for the, um, for the military. And I, I, I occasionally work with them up around the Gatwick area and various things. And I was talking to a guy that was working in battleship design. And he said, you can't, you can't, you can't prioritize any features in a battleship. And I said, you, you, well, you can. He said, no, you can't put half, half, the, half the hull in the, in the water. It'll sink. I said, well, of course you can't. But you, what you can do is put the hull in place. You can put the sleeping quarters. You can put basic weaponry, basic, basic systems in place. So you can get some benefit of it. It can sail and do what battleships do. But then you can fly in extra facilities while you're still getting that benefit. And he said, I've never thought of it in that way. And it's unusual not to be able to prioritize. But you've got to think it through. And I just think that, that little questionnaire, it's no more than that, just, um, just gives us some help with that. That's all. And I think it's a useful device. The manual just says the project manager is responsible for seeing that it's, it's answered realistically by the project roles up here. It's revisited here to support this decision making about not just is Agile the right approach, but how do we make it work? But personally, 
I see it as a good way of keeping tabs on how, how successful we're being with Agile, how it's working or not. And it really is about risk management. And I take Lloyd's point, you know, we would need to make sure those mitigation actions are added into the plan. And essentially that's tailoring Agile PM. Oh, I, got, I got on my soapbox a bit there, didn't I, Richard? Okay. Um, I think it's useful, no more than that. And, and I think we should stop there. I think we should stop there and have some lunch. See, time boxing is working. We're pretty much sticking to our times. Um, I was going to suggest 10 past one. Is that okay with everybody? 13, 10. So basically just under 45 minutes. We're going to get into a bit of detail this afternoon about the life cycle and products. Um, you'll find I've done the life cycle a couple of times deliberately. I'm just going to hone in on on chapters six and eight this afternoon, and then we'll lighten it up again. So we've got we've got a bit of bit of detail coming, uh, a bit of heaviness. But um, so make sure your brains are switched on for this afternoon, uh, and I'll see you at ten past one. Johnny. Hello. We're back in the room. Oh, excuse me. Okay, look, people coming back in. Nice to see everyone. So we're gonna let's give everyone a couple of minutes just to make sure they're here. Oh, it's good when you throw being down, it looks really good. It's like being in a nightclub. You need a glitter ball going around. Weird, isn't it? I just saying earlier, it was it's just Zoom. Teams doesn't do it. It's just literally this um the really? setup for this sort of yeah, weird. Okay. David, you're looking cold. You've got a scarf on there. You've got chilly again. Pay your gas bill, mate. It'll be all right. <laughs> I'm still saving up, Tony. <laughs> Don't blame you for that, my friend. Yeah. Who's cold in Cardiff now? Yeah. Tough going. Where are you in Cardiff? Which part? Grangetown, just opposite the uh, Millennium State, uh, Prince Party Stadium. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I know where you are. So you probably walked past my house a few times. Ah, okay. Probably did. On, on the side of the river there? Opposite side of the river, yeah. I don't know where the market is on a Sunday. I used to be. I don't know if it's still there. Yeah, it? just, just a bit further down the river than that. Ah, okay. Yeah. My, uh, um, my my grandmother was from the docks, so I used to live in uh, Clarence Embankment when I was a kid off James Street Bridge. Oh, uh, yeah. So, well, you know this part of town well, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm over yet. Yeah. I'm from the best parts of Cardiff. Doctor and land run, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I'm always in the best part, mate. Yeah. Anyone from Newport? Anyone from Newport? I can't remember. My wife's from Newport. She claims she's from Royal Oak, but we all know it's from England, really. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think Laura's got some, may have some issues with not very well tiled, so we'll crack on so uh what I've, what, I've, what I've done a couple of times to be honest is the the uh the process which is chapter six um so i, I just want to revisit that if i can and see if uh, uh so we, it's chapter six which is basically page 28 now i want you to be looking at if you would I'm hoping, but you'll tell me, I'm sure, that I'm, that I'm not going to be saying anything new in this short session. It's meant to be a short session, this, just to get you thinking again about what we've already covered. Because we've done it a couple of times now. Uh, so it's just a question of getting you thinking about it, um, what, what's in there, and uh, how, what, the, what the objectives of each process are. And... Uh, You often get this when you talk to things like uh, external auditors and so on. They say, "Well, you know, this this agile lark, it's a bit of a bit of a, a loose cannon, is it? W w where's the process? W w where where do you define what you're going to do? Where do you show that you've done it? And where do you try to improve it?" And the answer is, we do that because we have got a process. This is chapter six, basically. This, which which and for each of our six phases. We have some objectives for the phase and we produce outputs from it. So we, we do have a process, but we can uh, we can apply it, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a flexible way. 
and we can derive a life cycle from it, which works out how we're going to go through. So we can decide what an increment is. We can decide when, whether we're going to deploy at the end of each increment or not. And, and, and all I want to do is just to go quickly through pages 28 to, 20, to 30 and just get you confirming, if I may, that, you, that you're with me on, on, on the way the, the, uh, the process works. It's called the DSCM process, but I shouldn't worry about that. As far as you're concerned, it's, it's our job PM process, really. But um, don't be spooked tonight when you try the uh, sample paper if they use the initials DSDM rather than uh, Agile PM. But as far as you're concerned, they're synonyms. So this is talking about the process. <clears throat> Let me just go past this. Excuse me. Excuse your eyes. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're particularly attractive diagrams in the manual. I don't know what you think. I think the graphic designer could do a better job. Um, but here is the position of the, uh, the, the diagram that they use to define the process. As I say, it, it, um, it doesn't float my boat really, but there you are. Um, and we have six phases, one, two, three, four, five, six. Pre-project and post-project are included with that, which seems a bit odd to me, but there you are. Each phase has defined objective and the project manager's role varies from phase to phase. And what, what it says on the first bullet there is the process can be used to create a life cycle for each project. So when you're thinking about how you're gonna, work, how you're gonna run the project up here in foundations, you, you have to think about in your, in, when you're planning about what is the most appropriate life cycle. So where are our increments going to be? What, what represents a good first release? Are we gonna deliver incrementally? Hopefully we are. Are we gonna hold things up? Is, is an increment generally a number of time boxes grouped together to give us a release? Or do we have to just get one time box out there quickly? And this diagram is on page 93 of the manual. So that's gone beyond, uh, um, um, gone beyond um, foundation. And it just gives us an idea of, of some different ways through the process, really. I mean, what we typically have is the middle, middle line there as an example. We have feasibility and foundations, they're always sequential. Time box, time box, time box. Hang on. Okay, time box, time box, time box, deploy, which is what I really put on that, uh, on that, on, that, on my deployment, on my delivery plan. Time box, time box, deploy, time box, time box, deploy. You can be very agile. You can deploy at the end of each time box. So I, I sort of indicated that here. You could deploy, deploy, deploy at the end of each time box, which is very much like uh, what we do in the Scrum methodology. Um, that, that, that's, that's often a useful device if you need to get something out there very quickly to get your first time box out there very quickly. But what it can be, I think, it can be a very hectic um, life cycle. And what it often means is you don't get a chance to embed the change properly because everything is constantly changing. It's like if your apps are consistently updating, you never really get to grips with using them. So this is what we generally recommend, but you could do this. Um, and of course, if it's a small project, you could just have one deployment altogether. So, uh, but there is a question which comes up in the foundation is when is, what, what is the first time that we could deploy um, um, a feature? And it's at the end of a time box. You could deploy at the end of a time box. But generally, we have time boxes grouped into releases, which we call increments. And the honest answer is you have to decide. And it's really driven very much by the business uh, um, visionary. So let's just think about how the role of the project manager uh, sort of adjusts through the life cycle. Yeah. So pre-project, she or he's not there. Um, Watch out for this in the exams. They often ask you in which process or which phase do we do we identify the sponsor? They're, they're pre-project. And uh, basically the idea of pre-project is just to justify um, feasibility. As you'll see in the uh, next uh, session, all we produce there or the sponsor would produce would be some form of terms of reference. People often call it a mandate, but we call it terms of reference. So the project manager is not there yet. Where she or he comes into play is in feasibility. What we do in feasibility is we, we, we try and appoint at least the, the project roles. If we can appoint other people, that's great. We use the skipping snowman. But as many people as we can get involved because 
you know, the, what we need to do in feasibility is, as the name suggests, establish whether there's likely to be a feasible opportunity, whether there's a justification for it, and also whether Agile is the right approach. And we start to think about our six foundation products. And here are our six foundation products I mentioned before lunch. But they're all very much airy fairy high level at this point. But what we should be able to do is plan foundations. We have this idea of always being able to plan next steps. And at the end of that uh, feasibility uh, phase, we say, OK, do you want to go into foundations or should we just stop it here? And so if we're going to go into foundations, we should have planned foundations. So it's just enough effort to, to say, let's not bother, really. It's the equivalent for those of you who've been through my hands or anybody else's hands in Prince2. It's the equivalent of the starting up process. It's just thinking about whether it's worth going into foundations. And this is really a mechanism for kicking non-runners, if you see what I mean, into touch with a minimum of effort. If we're going to go for it, then we need to set it up properly. And foundations is basically setting it up and scoping it. And again, the idea is the project managers working with the project level roles and any other people that we've got identified to set it up in a reasonable way. Yeah? And what we say is we establish what we call firm foundations. And these are what we mean by that. You know, from a business perspective, we should have a justification in some form of business case. We should have a prioritized requirements list which is the scope of the project. Remember, that's a foundation question. If they ask you what is the scope of the project, it's the prioritized requirements list. By the way, everybody calls it the PRL. From a solution and technical perspective, we should understand what our solution is, what we're aiming at as a solution. I'm gonna talk about these in the next session and how we're gonna build and test it. So the solution is what are we aiming to put in place? Um, um, throughout the project and the development approach is how are we going to build and test it? And going back to the management approach then, we need a delivery plan. We need to know who's doing what and how we're going to control it. And we can draw it together into some kind of summary document or summary presentation if we want to. So essentially what the project manager is responsible here for is using collaborative practices in other words, in discussion, in workshops, and so on and so forth, drawing together all those things so that by the time we come out of foundations, we've got what we call firm foundations. So basically, we understand why we're doing it. We understand uh, who's doing what. We understand what the scope and what the target is. We understand when we're going to deliver. We're going to understand how we're going to go and control it and how we're going to go and test it. And as I say before lunch, if we, if we haven't got those things in place, how can we run it as a project? You need the answers to those questions. Okay, and the Agile PM, you ought to see them as a sort of coordinator to pull all that together. Not necessarily a technical expert, but drawing that information together. Then when we get into evolutionary development, okay? Evolutionary development is where really the solution development team are taking the lead. And the project manager handles over control to them. Yeah. So basically, evolutionary development consists of a number of solution development time boxes. Let's put that on there. Solution development time boxes. And by the way, when you see the practitioner exam on Thursday afternoon, they always show you how the project is split up into time boxes. And basically, this is where we kind of back off um, um, and let the team run its own processes. Let it run, they want the team to be empowered to run the process. So what we're focused on really is letting the team converge on an accurate solution that meets the need and is built the right way. So it's eyes on, hands off. And what, what the project manager's role essentially is to make sure the team have got all the facilities they need and all the resources they need to, to work on that solution and trying to protect them from distractions. Yeah, when I say protect them from distractions, you have to remember that there's no line management in project management. 
the project manager doesn't have direct control over the resources. It's very much a matrix kind of negotiated kind of approach. So it's all done by consent, really. And, you know, what may well happen is the developers might be pulled onto another job. We've got to try and protect them from that. The ambassador might say, look, I've got a lot of th things on. We try and protect them from that. Yeah. And also, as discussed, dealing with escalated issues. So it's, it's more about a watch and brief, making sure that they're running things in the right way. Now, what we generally do as a project manager is, is usually facilitate the kickoff event and the closeout event. Those are events, some people call them ceremonies, we call them events, and usually the project manager facilitates those. Yeah. Um, the idea of the kickoff event is to make sure that the team understand the objectives, the priorities, and the constraints, and feel that they've got the resources to realistically do the job. And then we let them plan their own work. We let them get on with it. At the end of the time box, what we've got to do is to look back and see what's actually been achieved, um, what hasn't been achieved, feed that back into the delivery plan, and to try to improve our behaviors for the next time box. So the project manager is really involved closely in the, in the, um, <clears throat> in the bookends, if you like. And now during the middle of a time box, you know, what they're doing is just keeping an eye, making sure that the ambassador, the advisors are rocking up, making sure that stand-ups are being held as agreed, make sure that the team is modeling, getting feedback and all the rest of it. And the only real reason they need to get involved during that is if a significant issue arises, which is essentially, coming up from the team. We're not quite sure what the requirement is. Okay, in that case, I'll have to filter that to the visionary. We're not sure how to do something. I'll filter that to the tech co-ord. Um, our key guy is left. We can't, de we can't deliver the must. Again, the project manager deals with all those escalated issues. The, 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 the POSI project now management name for that is managed by exception. So in other words, let the team run its own process, let the team run its own time box, unless there's a significant ash, uh, a significant um, issue which requires project management intervention. Then the other thing is, as we get towards the end of the increment, we will have to deploy plan deployment. So deployment activities, anything, anything to do with moving a part of the solution to live use are added into the delivery plan. So the idea of this is we need to make sure that when we go live, or when we're ready, when we go live, that the operational unit are ready for the change. So what we may have to do is we may have to retrain them in the new working practices, we may have to upgrade um, uh, operational equipment. We may have to adjust shift patterns. We may have to put some um, buddy systems in place. And also we'll have to make sure from a technical perspective that technical transition is enacted properly, moving it into a live environment. So the idea is we don't have a formally anyway, a separate deployment plan, but as we get towards the end of the increment, we should add any, any activities needed to go live into our, into our delivery plan. And they're off, that's often retraining the operational staff in the new working practice, writing new call center scripts and so on and so forth. And the project manager coordinates that work, but again, it's all done collaboratively. Deployment, well, deployment is about bringing a baseline. We use that word baseline, a part of the evolving solution into uh, live use. Um, and what I've talked about here is the idea that we deploy, deploy, deploy as we go through. And they often ask you this, when do we close the project after the last release? Because we now have all the solution in live in. Uh, in live in live use, so you know anything to do with um, with bringing part of the solution into live use is coordinated by the project manager. 
Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to coordinate that work. Now, you know, we need to make sure that the visionary who is responsible for the change is happy that what's been produced should lead to the benefits and also that the visionary has prepared the operational unit with the ambassador for the change. And the technical coordination need to be involved because of technical transition. Also, what the Agile PM does at the end of every increment is organize a retrospective. A retrospective, which is looking back at what's been achieved in the preceding increment, learning lessons for taking into the next increment. So we're always, we're always learning from experience. And what we produce as part of this is what we call a project review report, which might be a document or it might well be um, a PowerPoint presentation. And one of these is produced at the end of every increment. So at the end of the project, we should be able to look back over all the all, all the all the achievements that we achieved over the over the project and all any lessons that we can learn for the future. And so we do that at the end of every increment. And finally, once the once the project is closed, in other words, once we've got to the final deployment, the project manager pushes off. Okay, the project manager pushes off. It's like my friend Simon giving the keys to the B&Q to the store manager. Um, we push off. Yeah, but when we're closing down the project, it's incumbent upon the team to make sure that post-project post benefit measurement is put in place. So we shouldn't close down with make, without making sure we intend uh, to measure benefits beyond the end of the project. So, but the project manager is done. He or she is has be overseen the, the production of the solution. And all I've done there is just focus a little more on the project manager's role um, and taking you through the life cycle. So are there any questions on that I can answer? I think we've done the life cycle a couple of times, but we can, we can go through it a few more. It's called the DSBM process. Um, are we going to cover much of the practicalities or are we literally looking mostly at the process and the overall PM role? Uh, I guess what to specifically with practicalities, all of that stuff is going to need to take a kind of tangible form somewhere. And I wonder what you mean by the practicality. I mean, that's what the project manager is doing through, through evolutionary development. They're, they're overseeing the, the time of the teams. They're making sure that they're doing DSDM in the right kind of way, perhaps in collaboration with the coach. They're making sure stand-ups are being held. They're feeding anything back into the delivery plan. They're dealing with any escalated issues. Surely those are the practicalities. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think I'm mixing up some of the other roles. Okay. I can't believe if there's anything else you think we should be doing, I'll, I'll go over it. But I think that's what we do. Yeah, but it's not, it's kind of letting the, there's a balance in there between letting the team get on with it and making sure they're doing the right things. We're not, the, we're not, we're not the team expert, you know, that's the team sorts themselves out. But, you know, our job is really to make sure the business stays involved, you know, that Jake doesn't, if he's, if he's scheduled to come every morning, he does, that we're running stand-ups, um, that we're prioritizing, that we're modeling, we're prototyping. And at, the, and at the back end that we feed anything back into the, the delivery plan. But that's what we're really looking for, the delivery plan uh, to make it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you about that, Lloyd, in a moment. Yeah, look, uh, David, can I help you? Sorry, firstly. Yeah, it's just so I'm getting this completely right in my mind. In terms of uh, decisions about the roles that's happening in pre-project or feasibility, um, the only role which is put in place, great question, because they ask you this, the only role which is in place pre-project is the sponsor. Yeah. There's a bit of loose wording in the manual, to be honest, but we try to line up at least the project roles in feasibility, because obviously if we can't get people involved, then it, we, we haven't got a project anyway. And if we can identify the analyst advisors and by anyone we can involve in there, we do, but we need to have at least the project roles there. Yeah. Okay, so I thought, thanks. Uh, in your question, Lloyd, yes, the answer is yes, and I complain to the consortium. Um, I don't know if anyone, everyone saw Lloyd's point about it being lucky to open. If you notice what it says in the cover, yeah, they've changed the paper. They've changed the paper 
uh, for the new version. Um, and they've made it some sort of, uh, there is a statement just in front of the front cover, which is, says it's, it's sustainable. Uh, it, 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 yeah, they did. Um, they said I was the first one to complain, Lisa, because you remember that from when we did it the other week, yeah? Um, I complained to the uh, consortium. Uh, if you look inside the cover somewhere, it says this book is made of sustainable paper or something like that. Is there this, I can't remember what it's actually called now, but, they've, uh, but it, it means it's a thicker paper than we had originally. And it means that the spine Carbon balanced paper. Carbon balanced, that's it. Carbon balanced, yeah. It's all about green issues. Um, and what it means is the book is thicker than the original one. And the spine is tougher. It's it's tougher to it's tougher to keep flat, isn't it? To open completely wide, yeah. Um, and um, this only emerged from because they've only just introduced the new covers and the new paper. And the first people to use it were Lisa and Susan on something that we ran in the Angel Hotel about three weeks ago, wasn't it? I think something like that. So I took up cudgels on your behalf, uh, and I said this isn't good. And they said, oh. Nobody's complained yet, and I said, I'm sure they will. So we are where we are with that, I'm afraid. Um, you know, the, the old book had shiny, glossy paper, which wasn't, what is it, carbon balanced. Um, and when they changed the cover, they introduced this new paper type. And um, I kind of think that they'll have to do something about it in due course. Just for ease of searching uh, for the future, Tony, is there a way to get a PDF? literally because when you especially if it's open book as well it could save you so much time yeah you can you can you can you can you can uh, guess what you can buy a you can buy a, a pdf from the agile consortium um what we find is that people like the book for the exam i was mm. not least because they can scribble on it they can highlight it and they can do all sorts of things but you can certainly buy it as a pdf um and what happens after you've been on the uh uh you you, you, you've uh, done your exam. You should be invited by the Agile Business Consortium to join them free of charge uh, for a period of time. And um, you, you could even, if you if you do that, I think you, I'm guessing here, I think you can download it free. I think you can download it free. You can certainly read it free while you're a member because that's what I do. Um, and there's also other case studies and various bits and bobs on there, which are quite useful. But for for the guys coming on the course in the future though wouldn't that be accessible to have it before the course um we've done some research and people um, because uh people tend to prefer the the paper-based version yeah because if you think about it's it just... when you when you do your exam when you do your practitioner exam you're going to have several documents um you're going to have several windows open you've got the exam itself yeah, which you click through, you will also have the scenario and some additional supporting information to go. So you've got two windows open there. And people, the, the, the research we found was that people then don't want a third window, which is which is the, the PDF. But we're, we're open to suggestion on that. Yeah, I think it's just different ways of learning for different people, I think. But I, I think if the option's there moving forward, because I, I myself, like probably a few others, uh, a lot of times I work, I use two screens, so... Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't have a problem. Yeah, I mean, we're open to suggestion on that. I think I, what, what I might... I mean, I'll be honest with you, it's a lot easier for us to provide yeah. a PDF version because, you know, Kareem otherwise has to post out the manuals. Occasionally, he actually hand delivers them like he did for Ollis last week into the hotel in Cardiff. Um, and it, 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 it's a lot simple for us for PDF. But I, with with the people cert qualifications at Prince 2 and so on, um, there's it's a PDF manual now and people... People get, please can I have a hard copy. <laughs> I think it might be worth having an You option. can't win for everyone, can you? You can't win. Maybe the option would be the best way forward. I'll put that to Kareem. I think if, that's probably a good idea myself. Just if you're going to do the hard copy, do, do it loose leaf. Honestly, I've been trying to open this and hold it open going through the stuff you've been going through. And it's been really difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, the only thing I'm thinking of doing now is cutting the pages out and just having yeah. it loose leaf myself, which is, uh, you know, you could provide it like that, I suppose. Speaking of all the, yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> The book is published by the Agile Business Consortium, so I mean that—that's them, if you like. I know I'm ducking out of that one. We—that—that's the book. Um, but I mean, I'm—I will feed back again, again this week, and say to the consortium, we've had more uh, disquiet, shall we say, about the fact that it's hard to lay flat. Um, and, and you know, it's obviously something which has only happened since um, January, really. 
because they changed the books, the, the paper. But I think what they've done, they haven't really, they haven't really thought that one through in detail. I agree with you. I, I suppose the best way to say it is ask them to open page 96, 97, um, and then write whilst they're holding that down with their left hand. That's right in the middle, isn't it? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, it's very difficult to me. I, I mean, again, Lisa and Susan will know that this came up uh, when we first used the books a couple of weeks ago in the Angel Hotel in Cardiff. Um, and it's it's a feature of the new paper that they're using. So I have fed it in. I'll feed it in again that we had more, more suggestions about that. Um, and I think, you know, if we can put an option up where you can have PDF and or the book, that would be good. See, maybe it's the first prototype and what they need to do is to continuously improve it. What do you reckon? Sounds really agile PM type that. Yeah. Well, I always I always pass on the feedback. Um, um, I, they won't produce it loosely, if I can assure you, but they should improve the binding and so on. And the more we can feedback, the better. So I will. It's like people say about the exams. You get people saying, "Oh, it's all bloody exam. The questions are well. The questions are the questions. We can't do anything about the questions. You know, when I when we review the exam tomorrow, I'll be able to explain why the answer to every question is what it is." What is what I what I can't necessarily therefore do is to say why they worded it in that way. You know, there's a sort of we're in the hands of the exam board with that one. Okay. Uh, any more about the uh, the process? Are you comfortable with that? Okay. Now we're coming into what is undoubtedly probably the the heaviest session of the time we're going to be together. Um, it's I don't think it's overly heavy, but it depends on how much you understand kind of the nature of projects, I think, because we're gonna talk about chapter eight, which is what we call the DSDM product. So if you can try and open your book at page 38, that would be good. And, and, and in common with all project management guidance, not just the uh, Agile PM, Agile PM is product-based. In other words, we produce things from our from our life cycle, and they may well be documents or they may well be PowerPoint presentations. Um, um, and of course, the main thing that we're going to produce is what we call the evolving solution. Yeah, the evolving solution. And, and there's a, um, a picture on page 38, which is repeated on page 102. Um, which looks like an explosion in a paint factory, which I'm going to take you through uh, in a few moments because it tries to describe this idea of products. So if, if you've come from a prints or an APM perspective, you'll know about management products and so on, uh, the documents that we have to get us through the life cycle. So um, all, all, all projects produce, all project management approaches and projects produce what we call products. Uh, in the Scrum world, we call them artifacts, um, but we keep away from that. So we have products. I'm sharing my screen deliberately. Yeah. So, you know, we have the, we have two kinds of products. We have those which develop or evolve through the life cycle. Guess what? They're called evolutionary products. So these extend and refine through the life cycle. A good example of that, if you can see my flip charts at the moment, is the business case because we have an outline business case in feasibility, which evolves to become a full business case uh, in foundations and is reviewed and updated at the end of every increment. So the business case evolves through the life cycle. Yeah. Also, you will find in a moment that the prioritized requirements list evolves through the life cycle. We first start thinking of it in feasibility, evolves to become a firm scope here, but it will probably change as we go through the life cycle. So any product which evolves or refines, updates through the life cycle is called an evolutionary um, product. And the main evolutionary product is, of course, the solution, because the solution evolves through evolutionary development. Okay, and then we have another kind of product. These are called milestone products. And milestone products are snapshots. So for example, 
we need to make a decision coming out of feasibility about whether it's worth going into foundations. Yeah. What you might need to produce to support that decision making is to produce some kind of feasibility report, or we call it a feasibility assessment. That's the snapshot of what we found in feasibility. Now, what that, how that feasibility assessment physically manifests will depend on the project. It might well be a feasibility report, like a document. It could be a presentation which is made by the project manager at the end of feasibility. So it could be a PowerPoint slide or set of, or it might not be necessary at all because it's just a snapshot of what we produce there. Another example is after foundations. We might need to produce some kind of foundation summary here so that a decision can be made about whether we're happy to go into the first increment. Now, a lot depends on how formal decision making is. You know, if you're getting grant funded projects where you have to make a formal um, application, if you like, for the funding, foundation summary is often a formal report. If it's an internal project you, with internal funding, you, you probably don't even need to bother to produce it, but it's a snapshot. Another good example of a, a milestone product is at the end, at the end of every uh, increment, we do a retrospective and we will produce the project review report. And this gets produced at the end of every increment. So once again, this is a milestone product. It's a snapshot, if you like, of what we, what we achieved in that, um, in that increment and what lessons we can learn going forward. And if, although we call it a project review report, it doesn't have to be a document. It could just be um, a, a, a set of slides in a PowerPoint presentation or a workshop presentation in some way. So we have products which evolve, and these are called evolutionary products, the main one being the solution. And we have milestone products, which are snapshots at a particular point in time, which are there for what we call governing reasons. And because they know they were they're there for governance reasons, governance reasons, sorry, and this is really silly, they're shown throughout the book with a G. So when you see a product mark with a G, it means it's a milestone product, which is damn stupid because either they should call them governance products or they could they should mark them with an M. But anything which a G is is a snapshot, which is often there to support decision making. So they often ask you, here are two kinds of, here is a question which comes up. What are the two kinds of products? Evolutionary and milestones. Yeah. So here's the thing. We don't produce, we don't necessarily, we don't produce products unless there's any reason to do it. We try to be fairly lean. So what, what I mean by that is if we don't need to produce a formal feasibility assessment, to enable the decision to be made whether we go into foundations, well, don't produce it. If we don't need to produce a foundation summary, well, don't produce it. You know, there's no point producing things for the sake of everything. The other thing is we have some outlines for our products. You can think of them as very high level templates. And I've tried to use this expression quite a lot over the last day or two we've been together. We don't say how they physically manifest themselves. So for example, one of our evol evolution products is the delivery plan. And you'll see where we discuss this fairly shortly, that the delivery plan takes us from the beginning to the end of the project in a fairly high level way. It breaks the project down into increments, which are potentially deployable releases. And we allocate time boxes to at least the first increment. It's produced by the project manager in collaboration mainly with the visionary, but also the tech co-ord, you'll see this shortly, but nowhere does it say it's a Gantt chart or it's a spreadsheet or it's a critical bath diagram or it's posted notes stuck on a wall or it's a Kanban chart, but you, a Kanban board, but you can, you can represent it in whatever way suits you, suits you for, suits you. So 
we describe the products in terms of their purpose and what and who produces them and what they're intending to do but nowhere do we say what they physically look like and that's quite an important idea to us because as i say you know if you do have to produce a foundation assessment or a sorry a feasibility assessment or a foundations a summary you decide what it looks like you will have to produce a delivery plan you decide what it looks like yeah so in deciding what it looks like of course you might have to be um, um, informed by you may have to comply with corporate standards for example i work on sites where they say okay um, the feasibility assessment and the foundation summary will be PowerPoint presentations. Okay, that's a corporate standard. We should comply with it. Um, again, I work on a site where they say uh, delivery plans must be produced using MS Project or Primavera, and they need to be Gantt charts. Okay, we'll do that. Then. So you often have to be comply with corporate standards. Um, quite often, contractual relationships will determine the formality of a product. You know, for example, in my world, teams often get paid at the end of an increment. So the, the project review report needs to be a formal document. They often get paid at the end of a time box. So you'll see that there's a time box review report, which needs to be a formal document. You know, and if we're subject to external audit, external scrutiny, we may have to produce additional uh, products to satisfy our auditors. So the idea is when we're up here, we think about the level of um, documentation, the level of products that we have to produce and the formality. And this is all on a project by project basis. Yeah. And again, we've got the, uh, the three types of products, which I'm going to take you through in a moment. Now, we outline the products on pages 38 to 40. This is what I'm going to take you through in a moment. Um, you need to you need to be able to find those fairly quickly for the practitioner exam, but also we, we provide a little more detail in chapter 16, which starts at page 102. 102 and we, I'll take you through these in a moment and what you'll see for each product sort of tells you, I don't think they are detailed really, but I think it tells you what the purpose of each product and who's involved in its creation. And what we have for each product is what we call a racy table. Can I check, has everyone come across the idea of a racy table? It's a project thing, which is used in all sorts of uh, project management methods. Um, Martina and Courtney, I'm not sure if you would have come across these. Racy tables? No, all, all it means is for each product that we produce, in other words, each thing that we produce, we, 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 just, we describe who is responsible for its production. So well, who actually does it? Yeah, who signs it off? In other words, who is accountable for it? Who approves it? That's the A. So R works to A, if you like. Who gets consulted during its construction? And who gets, who should know about it? And they're called racing tables. And they're, they're a feature of all project management approaches, to be honest. And if you look at this table, which is on page 115, bear with me, Lloyd. Um, uh, if you look at this table on 115, here is an overall racy for all the products. Because atop the, across the top matrix, we've got all the products. And down the left, we've got the roles. And if you just pick a good one, let me just pick the prioritized requirements list. So here is that particular product. Who is, which role is responsible for drawing it together? Well, you'll see there, it's the business analyst. Who is accountable for it? In other words, who approves it, who signs it off? It's the business visionary. And who is consulted to pull it, to enable it to be constructed? Well, it's the business ambassador and the business advisors. And everyone should know what the scope of the project is. So that's the racy for that particular product. Uh, Lloyd, how can I help? Yeah, sorry, this uh, this manual, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen it, actually. It's saying it's co co contributors. I've yeah. never seen that before. No, it's usually consulted. They use, in the manual, they, there's a, I'll be honest with you, there's a couple of glitches, and that's one of them. It's usually consulted, but in the manual, they use the word contribute at some points, and they use the word consulted at other points. But in the individual ones, they use the word contributed. Same thing, though, really, to be honest. 
Okay, but it's a good, good point. There are a couple of glitches. I'll point out another one later on. But can you see what I've done there with that RACI table? So the responsibility for reducing the prioritized requirements list uh, is the business analyst. So he or she draws out the requirements from interviewing the ambassadors and the advisors, but who needs to be happy with it? Who needs to sign it off? Um, it's the visionary. Okay, so that's just very quickly through the idea of products. And again, it, it shouldn't be alien to people. We know everyone in print knows we have management and specialist products. But if you haven't come across this idea before, it's a bit of an awkward one that projects produce products. And what I'd like to do, if I can, is to try to unpick that diagram, which is on page 38 and which is repeated on page 102 of the manual. Page 38 or, uh, is the best place for it. And then we'll look at each product in its own right. Um, this diagram does look overly complicated. It doesn't copy well, um, but I think if you can understand what they're trying to show you, it's actually quite a good diagram. Because let's have a look at this and then we'll, we'll, we'll look at a bit more detail. Across the top, in the top stripe, in sort of the gray boxes, you ought to recognize those are the six phases of our process. Pre-project, feasibility, foundations, evolutionary development, deployment, and post-project, yeah? So that's, if you like, the process, the life cycle. Then underneath the words feasibility and foundations, there's a rightward facing arrow. And it says in there, level of detail, level of detail. And what it's trying to say is the products, the, the products under that arrow, are um, are produced in outline in feasibility and are firmed up in foundations. And you will see in due course that one of those products is the outline business case, which is created in feasibility and is firmed up to become the business case or the full business case in foundations. So they refine, they evolve as we go through. Then if you look under the under feasibility and foundations phases, you can see three broad stripes, an orange stripe for business. So we keep the same colors, a green stripe for solution and a blue stripe for uh, management. So we can just go through those. Uh, the, the graphic designer has tried to shade the colors as well. So if you look at the orange stripe, it's sort of implying that you have a business case which evolves throughout foundations. And by the time we come out of foundations, we have a firm business case. Similarly, with the prioritized requirements list, we would have first started thinking about our requirements in feasibility, but very much in high level. We'd like to have a new website. We want a marketing campaign. Uh, we want a rebrand. Um, the manual actually says less than 10 high level requirements, which are often called epics. Epics. And the idea is as we come through foundations, we look at it more closely. We now have less than 100 requirements down here. And this supports the idea, which I mentioned from yesterday morning, almost right at the very beginning. But what we need to do is to move away, move away from the idea that the customer should know precisely what they want up front. We, we, we remove that, that idea from it because what we say is the requirements should evolve through the phases. And the idea is that we have a very small number of very high level requirements written up here, if you like, but we've got them firmed up as the scope coming out of foundations and the absolute detail emerges through evolutionary development. And so, you know, we get more precise as we go through. The detail emerges through the life cycle. And one quite cheesy way of thinking of this, if you go to a quarry, You'd have boulders up here, which are less than 10 epics. They get broken down to rocks through foundations and the gravel 
emerges through evolutionary development. So they become more accurate and more precise as you go through. And that's what that's trying to say, that by the time we come out of foundations, we should have a firm scope, which is our PRL. We're gonna walk all through these. Again, if you look at the green stripe, and we're gonna walk through all these, in feasibility, we might have a very broad idea of what we're aiming at. A new retail park, a new housing development. Um, yeah, pretty picture, but by the time we come out of foundations, we should have set a bit more detail into our solution, what we're thinking of aiming at. It's still going to be just the kind of artist impressions. It's hard to describe this. I'll try and do it when we do the next session. Yeah. And again, by the time we come out of foundations, we should have specified what I always call the quality plan, the development approach, how we're going to build and test it, what standards it's going to be built into, what tools and techniques we're going to use, and how we're going to review, inspect, and test. And this is our development approach. Again, the idea is the solution should, we should first start thinking about it in feasibility, but we should understand what solution we're aiming at, um, our coming out of foundations. And by the time we come out to the foundations, we should also have decided exactly how we're going to build and test it and to what standards the work is going to be built. So it's this idea of becoming more precise. Similarly with the delivery plan. The delivery plan actually starts life up here. When we put, we might put a broad sort of plan together, which says this is going to take four to seven months and this should be, you know, but the idea is again, by the time we come out of foundations, we have it firmed up. It's going to change thereafter but we have a plan, a workable, achievable plan coming out of foundations. And the last one on that is the management approach. Again, up here, we started to line up the key players, think about who's gonna get involved. We need to firm up their commitment levels as part of uh, foundations. And we also should start to think about how we're gonna control progress how are we going to engage with the wider stakeholders? We'd have to get Mariana involved in that. I think I love the cat, Mariana, by the way. Um, and that's that's it. So by the time the idea is by the time we've come out of foundations, all these things are set up. We have a clarity over why we're doing it, we have clarity over who's doing what, we know what our scope and our priorities are, we know what we're aiming at. We've got a plan and we know how we're going to build and test it. And that's really setting up the project in a reasonable way before we go forward. Now you will see again under the right phase of the life cycle, we'll take a bit break in a moment, that we start off under pre-project with some form of terms of reference which is a snapshot of why it's worth going into feasibility, which is pulled together by the, um, uh, by the sponsor. If you look at the, the, the bottom of the column of feasibility, so look at the bottom of the co feasibility column, you'll see we might need to produce a feasibility assessment. That's a milestone. At the bottom of the foundations column, we might need to produce a foundation summary that's a milestone. At the end of every time box, we may well produce a time box review record. So we have a time box review record, which is produced to show what happened in the time box. And I'll take you through all of these things when we've had a short break. And at the end of every, uh, every increment, underneath deployment, you'll see, we have a project review report. And finally, at the end, when the project is complete, we have our benefits assessment. But the big thing is a big green wheel. Because the big green wheel is the evolving solution. And that, that is under, not going to surprisingly, evolutionary development. And the idea being that 
what we'll do based on our business case, based on our priorities, based on our target and, and our plan and what we need to do, we evolve the solution. And it's a circular wheel because it's iterative. And at any point, this was the thing I was trying to make out about the spinning plates. At any one point, we could have a model, we could be prototyping, we could be testing and so on. So the evolving solution evolves through evolutionary development. Yeah? And we could be working on different parts of the solution at any given time. And going to the bottom right of that wheel, we, we, we deploy, we deploy, we deploy, deploy. And so deployment is putting a subset, if you like, we call it a baseline of the solution into live use. So the evolving solution gets deployed, 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 deployed. And the idea is, you see the bits of the jigsaw coming together. The idea is that we close the project when all the bits of the jigsaw are gone live. And that's me trying to unpick that diagram. And it's actually, if you can understand it, it's not a bad diagram. Yeah. So we start to think about things in feasibility. We firm up the why, the what, the who, and the how during foundations. We build the solution on an, on a, on an iterative way. And we deploy, 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 deploy. Once we finish the last deployment, we close the project. And we should make sure when we close it, we have ongoing benefit measurement. Does that kind of make sense from that diagram? Yeah, can you see what's happening here? Yeah. And the point to be made is in a traditional project, you know, the project is only in one, the, the, the solution is only in one state. But the idea of our agile approach is, you know, traditional, you're either in design, you're in build, or you're in test. With our agile approach, you know, there's a lot going on. We've, we're, we're evolving that. We've deployed that, we're looking at the next increment, we're improving that, we're thinking about new requirements, and that's our evolving solution. What I tried to do there was just take you through the diagram, really, but what's quite important is you understand what each of those products are. There's a little outline of them on page 38 to 40, and I think what I'd like to do is to take you through those, if I can and get you thinking about who produces each one and what we mean by each one. I'm pretty sure after that really exciting session, we could do with a short break. And so I thought we'd meet again at 2.15 and I'll take you through the uh, the products because it's quite important to understand the products. Okay, so see you at 2.15. Um, this is the heaviest part of the week. So I think we're back. I think we're back. So. Trevor's on the phone on the phone to his bookie. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll take up cudgels again on your behalf about the binding. We are in the hands of the consortium. I think maybe the green issue has overtaken the practicalities of the book. And I'll talk to Kareem about well, well, we're already looking to see if people would prefer a PDF. It's a, it's in that kind of mode. People have different ideas at the moment, but PDF is certainly simpler for us. Um, so what I want to do now is share my screen again and just take you through um, the, um, the products. And one of the reasons for focusing quite a bit on this area, even though it's uh, a bit, we're beyond on this point, we're beyond uh, foundation, is because we're starting to look now towards the practitioner exam. And in the practitioner exam, there is no guesswork. Right. The pr practitioner exam has four topics. And they will tell you what each topic is. And here are the four topics. People and roles, which we've covered quite a lot, I think. <clears throat> Planning and control, which is talking about the delivery plan, time box plans, deployment activities, and so on. Um, techniques, which are often referred to in the manual as practices. Moscow, um, 
um, time boxing, uh, workshops, iterative development, and so on. And the last one is life cycle and products. So it's important that you understand the life cycle, which essentially is chapter six, and the products, which are chapter eight, in the main, yeah? Um, but there's a bit more information in, about the products um, in the latter part of the manual, which is actually uh, chapter 16. And all I want to do is just take you through that if I can. But mainly what you need are pages 38 to 40, because um, um, that's, that, that, that's where all the detail is. Um, but I'm going to flick, get you flicking back between the books, between uh, chapter six, which is most of what you want in chapter 16, just to try and get you thinking about the different things. So bear with me while I share the screen. So hopefully I got that idea of products over, two kinds of products, and that we just produce the appropriate kind of documentation that we need. So looking at this, so the business products, firstly, um, and you can see a link here to the more detailed outlines, which are useful in some cases, in some cases not. So on the business product, the first one is some form of terms of reference. Now, again, we, 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 we can't possibly know what this looks like. You know, uh, a lot of people would call it <clears throat> a mandate um, or a charter for the project. It's basically the sponsor at the very outset justifying feasibility, no more. Just outlining the drivers for the project, whether it's a compliance project, whether we're trying to make money, save money, and so on. Broad objectives. And going back into some of the things that uh, Paul has said, really, if the project is linked to other projects, how it fits with other projects. Then we have the business case. Yeah, I've tried to take you through the idea of a business case quite a few times so far. Um, in the last day or two. Yeah, the business case is basically a summary of the justification for the project. It's basically a summary of the gain against the pain. We create an outline business case in, uh, in feasibility. It's firmed up to become a full business case coming out of foundations, and we keep an eye on it all the way through. What we do is review and update it at the end of every increment to make sure the project remains worth investing in. So it's basically the pain against the game, <clears throat> and there needs to be some kind of investment appraisal, <coughs> excuse me, carried out, which is outside the scope of our LPM, to, uh, uh, to, to determine whether the gate, whether the project is desirable and viable and achievable. Some people call that. Um, cost benefit analysis. And then if you come to one which is more interesting, I think the prioritize requirements list. Okay. So I've talked about the idea of this and I'm going to get you working with one in the next exercise, the next session. Uh, prioritize requirements list. Um, one of the things I've been keen to get over is the idea that we, 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 we take pressure off the business representatives they don't, they no longer have to define the absolute detail of their requirements up front. What we say is their requirements will evolve through the life cycle. And what we have is a small number of high level epics in feasibility broken down into uh, uh, less than 100. So the manual says in, in foundations with the absolute detail emerging down here. So the detail emerges later rather than sooner. And we document them in something called the prioritized requirements list. And the prioritized requirements list is just that, a list of requirements which are prioritized using the Moscow uh, Convention. It should be linked to the objectives. We first uh, think about it in feasibility. And at the end of foundation, it should be firmed up because that is the scope of the project. Watch out for that as a foundation question. What is known as the scope of the project? It's the PRL, the Prioritized Requirements List. And then we will explore the detail of each requirement uh, in evolutionary development. So for example, in Miller's, um, coming out of foundations, uh, there may be a, a requirement expressed as, as a customer, I want to be able to browse um, products for sale on your website. 
Yeah, that could be a reasonable thing to come out of foundations. What we would consider in evolutionary development is the various filters you might apply to that browse. Um, should we, um, should we, for example, uh, be able to browse by by um, size of jar, by price, by ingredients, and so on. Another reasonable one would be uh, coming out of foundations is that as a customer, I want to be able to make a secure payment um, on your website. Um, in evolutionary development, you might establish whether that's going to be Google Pay, Apple Pay, the back system, PayPal, and so on. So the detail and the solution emerge through evolutionary development. What I'm hoping you're starting to see is that the requirements become more precise as we go through. Now, what we have, and in this one is page 104, if you could just look for me, is we have an outline for each of our products. Page 104 is the outline for the, for the PRL. It doesn't tell you much more than I'm saying, but it does tell you who is involved in its creek construction. So if you look halfway down um, uh, page 104, it says the PRL, everyone calls it a PRL, by the way, is an evolutionary product. OK, so it evolves through the life cycle. It describes at a high level the requirement that's, that the project needs to address and gives priority linked to objectives because you know, the requirements have to link to the objectives of the project. Consideration of requirements begins in feasibility, right? And a baseline demarcate, de demarcate, demarcates the scope of the project at the end of foundations. So we have a clear scope at the end of foundations. This is not what we have in product development, but we have a clear scope here. The next couple of lines are really important. After that point, further change will happen naturally in terms of depth. So the detail emerges through evolutionary development. Changes of breadth, in other words, adding, removing, or significant, significantly changing items on the PRL require formal control. In fact, they have to go back to the visionary. So if we say, oh, we found this new requirement, the team can't work on it. They have to feed it back to the visionary. So the team explores depth detail. They can't add breadth. And then you have a racy table for this particular product, which gives you some uh, basic ideas about it. So who is responsible for producing it? The business analyst. But they would produce it um, in, in, based on contributing contributions, collaboration, I'll be with you now, Alex, with the business ambassador and the business advisor. So here comes the role of the business analyst, teasing out the requirements by talking to the business representatives. Who is accountable for it? In other words, who approves it? Who needs to be clear that the PRL will lead to the, delivering the requirements in their PRL will lead to the vision? It's the visionary. And who should know what the scope of the project is? Everyone. Alex, how can I help you? Yeah, just, it might be my poor grasp of English, but I've seen it a few times now, the word baseline being used. And so in, in that in that sense, consideration of requirements begins in feasibility and a baseline of PRL demarcates uh, the scope of the problem. What, what, what does it mean What what in that context or in the yeah, context? In that context, in the project management context, it means once we've agreed something it, or proved something, it becomes baselined. So a version, think of it as a version, a version of the... Um, uh, of, of the of of the uh, of the PRL will be the scope. If we change it, then we create a new baseline. So once something is approved, do we call it baseline yet? Right. Okay. It's like at the end of an increment, a baseline of the solution goes into the live operational uh, um, environment because it's it's a it's a it's a version of it. It's it's an agreed statement of it, if you like. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, though, because, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of project management jargon there. Paul? Um, would a baseline be some kind of form or equivalent to an MVP? Uh, well, it can be an MPV. Um, we don't use the expression in our job, PM, so I wouldn't go into that. But, yeah, an MPV would be a baseline, which we're, we're trying to get some validated learning from if we were using other approaches, yes. Thank you. Um, I 
we can talk about MV. I wouldn't confuse people with terminology which we don't use. So that's uh, my, my only understanding with the exam, right? No, so it's more for my understanding because yeah. MVP is something I've used and, and it's just yeah. to understand how they correlate. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you can see that one goes. Now, then we go on to the, the blue products. Yeah, which are our de delivery plan and our uh, management approach definition. I think they've gone a bit silly here. I don't know if you noticed, they got mad, a sad, and a dad. Did you notice that? Mad, sad, dad. Fortunately, we haven't got bad, but there we are. Um, so um, here we're saying, okay, we need to produce a delivery plan. This is a high level schedule. Sorry, there's a typo here. That should say increments for the project. High level schedule of increments for the project. And we should schedule time boxes for the forthcoming or next increment. And this is what I tried to show you here quite a lot in a very simple way. And that would be fine as a delivery plan. And if you look at the um, outline on page 106 this time, and again, not great, it, it's right at the bottom of the page. The delivery plan is an evolutionary product, yes, because we start to think about it in feasibility and it gets baselined or agreed. Think of it in those terms, Alex. Coming out of foundation, it provides a high level schedule of increments for the project. Here we go. Releases, if you like, which have been basically agreed with the visionary. Uh, there's no task levels on it, but the time boxes that make up the first increment, at least, are shown on the, on the delivery plan. Yeah, that's all it says. If you look at the racy top of the next page, it tells you the project manager produces it. They can, you know, everyone contributes to it. It's collaborative planning, if you like. But who needs to agree that it's a reasonable plan? Who needs to sign it off? Most certainly the visionary. And if there's technical transition to be brought into play, then also the tech cord. Yeah, but nowhere does it say it's post-it dates stuck on a wall. Nowhere does it say it's a Gantt chart or, or we're going to use MS project or anything like that. But you can if you want to. Okay, that's the idea of it. You see, we don't we don't impose what things look like, but often there's a corporate view on that. Then we then we got the MAD. Okay, anything to do with managing the project as a whole gets documented in the MAD. This quite often isn't a document. You know, for example, who, who's going to be playing a role in this project? Quite often, it's just a head and shoulders shots, uh, like a sort of um, um, a graph on the wall. You know, what, um, what I can't remember what they call them now, when they have an organization structure on the wall with pictures of this is the sponsor, this is the visionary, and so on. But that's all it needs to be, really. Um, so it shows you who's carrying out the roles. Uh, it also talks about how we're going to engage with stakeholders. And I think we underplay this. I'm sure Mariana would agree. We need to really important that we do engage with our stakeholders. We, we take the view that anyone or any body or any organization that has an interest in the project, and even you can affect it or is affected by it, is a stakeholder. And we need to do some assessment of uh, people's attitudes to the change, whether they're opposite, opposing it, they're on side, where their areas of power and influence are. This is all around the edges of Agile PM. And decide, and decide proper um, comms plan or engagement with the stakeholders. And that's what's part of the MAD. Most people would put a comms plan together. Uh, we don't actually call it that though, but anything to do with how we're going to engage with the, uh, stake, with the stakeholders goes in the MAD. The other thing is how are we going to keep monitoring progress? And one good way of monitoring progress in a very simple way, and they often pick up this in the exam, are burn down charts. Yeah, usually there's one of these on a whiteboard. Burn down charts show work outstanding over the time span of the, of the time box. Not tasks, but work outstanding. And the idea is that we can reflect on this at each stand up, and it gives us early visible warning um, of whether the time box is behind schedule, on schedule, and whatever. Page 198 is the only place that's mentioned in the manual in the watcher. If we go to the next page, they love to try and confuse you between the sad and the dad. And it's quite hard to, um, it's hard, hard to, it's quite hard to define what the sad looks like. Um, because it, 
people often call it an artist's impression of the new of the new of the new state of the uh, of the solution. And you know, I, I, I I'm just thinking now. I was looking on the web last week because they've announced a new development in Cardiff between Lisbon and Pomprena. And if you get onto the council's website, uh, you can see there's a nice pretty picture of what it's gonna look like in three years or four years when they've built two and a half thousand houses and supporting infrastructure. And it also shows you the first phase will be, you know, um, uh, a development of 103 bedroom houses. The second phase will be a retail complex. The third phase will be the school and so on. And it's kind of an artist's impression. Whether it'll actually turn out like that will be something else. But it just gives you an indication without any real detail of what we're going to put, what, what we're aiming at. And it's called, it's what we call the SAD. Again, I, I live on, on, on the eastern side of Cardiff. We don't have very good transport links. Nigel Roberts, who's a well-known business in the area, is trying to get us to have a, um, a, a new station which will bring us into Cardiff so we don't have to drive in or green and all the rest of it. Um, he's put plans into Welsh Government, which they put on hold. Mm. Um, and if you get on the web, you can see the plans for the, for the railway station. You can see there's intending to be a business park around it and a shopping complex as well. And it's a pretty picture of what we're aiming at without going to any detail. And that's called the SAD. Okay. And it's often just websites or some models and so on. And the idea of it is this third bullet point is important. It gives us an indication of where we're going without being so absolutely precise that it turns into a specification. Because if it's so, if it's very precise and it says it will definitely, definitely look like this, then you know, then then you've got no opportunity to develop and innovate. Yeah. So those kind of models, those kind of diagrams, don't show what bricks are going to be used, don't show what heating is going to be in, and so on. Don't show what standards that we're going to build it to, because we leave that to the dad. So the dad gets the dad. Um, uh, defines the, the, the tools, the techniques, the quality standards that are going to be applied to the construction, including external standards like ISO 9000, cybersecurity standards, GDPR, and so on. It also describes whether we're going to do the work internally or whether they're going to outsource it. And it also has the testing and review strategy in it. And they quite often ask you in which of our products would you find the testing strategy? And it's in the dad, not the sad. So one way of thinking of the difference between the two is the sad is what we're aiming at, and the dad is how we're going to build it, how we're going to test it. And you can see outlines on page 105, 106. And I think the important thing to see about that is the sad is pulled together um, by the analyst and has to be assigned off by the uh, visionary whereas the dad is very much a technical document. I'd rather see it as a quality plan, really. And you don't have to stick to the names of our products once you get past the exam. But the dad is very much technical. This is how we're going to build it. We're going to use brown bricks. We're going to use um, uh, gas central heating. The central heating will comply with gas board regulations. So this is all the dad. Well, the sad sort of says, we're going to build these lovely houses. They're going to be really nice. So people often call the SAD as an artist's impression, um, blueprint kind of idea. And that's taking you through, to be honest, the six products which are filmed up coming out of foundations. Business case, which describes why we're doing it. Management approach, which describes who's going to do what, how we're going to control the project. Prioritize requirements list, which is the scope. Target, which is the solution architecture. The quality plan, how we're going to build and test is the development approach. And they evolve through the first two phases. And there may be further change later on as well. I mean, we will do that as we go through because they may well have to change as we go through. And then we come on to our first milestone products. If we have to make a big decision at the end of feasibility, we may need to produce a milestone feasibility assessment. If we have to make a big decision at the end of foundations, 
we might need to produce a foundation summary. But you only produce them if you need to. And again, we don't say, we don't say um, what they look like. But both of those are the responsibility of the project manager. And both need to be signed off by the sponsor. We got the sponsor. These, these are basically funding decisions. And the sponsor would need to make that decision. But that's only if it's a very formal kind of project. Well, are we really building the solution? And we don't really know what that looks like, do we really? Because an IT project would deliver a different, a different solution to a construction project and so on. So we don't know what it looks like. Um, but it, all we do know is it's what the solution development team build and they need to build it uh, to the standards defined by both the visionary for business requirements and the technical coordinator for technical standards. Yeah, so everyone's involved, but the team are responsible for delivering the, the, the evolving solution. And the reason it's a wheel is at any given time, the solution could be in different states. You know, we, we're, we're modeling that, we're reviewing that, we're testing that, we've, we've delivered that, and so on. And that's why it's a wheel which turns on an incremental basis. And that's what the solution development team are responsible for bringing into, 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 into existence. It needs to be approved by the visionary that they're happy with what's been produced. It should lead to the benefits and the tech award needs to be happy it meets any technical standards. And then we go back to the blue slope here, which is our time box plan. And our time box plan is not created by the project manager. They often ask you in the, in the, uh, uh, in the exams, which plan is not produced by the project manager and it's the time box plan. The time box plan is drawn up by the team, drawn up by the team, usually facilitated by the team leader. And it's our task level plan. It says, okay, it's the team saying, we know, dear project manager, we know what you want us to work on. We believe we've got the resources to do it. Now leave it to us. We will sort ourselves out. We will plan our own work. This is no different from in Prince when they, the team plans its own team plans. This is called the time box plan. So this is usually scribbled up, written up on a whiteboard. Yeah, and it's down to task level, created by the team. It's updated on a daily basis. Again, they often ask you in the exam, how frequently does the time box plan get updated? And the answer is daily through, through, through the, um, the stand-up. Because the stand-up gives us an indication of our progress against work to date and we can adjust as we go. So this evolves through the time box. And the last thing on this is that somebody in the team needs to be act, needs to act as this kind of scribe. That's probably the best way of thinking of them, as a scribe um, to keep an indication of what decisions were made, what, what was agreed at any given point, and it's called the time box review record. Time box review record. And all it is is the team's notebook, often kept by the team leader. I know what you're going to say, Lloyd, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I think I know what you're going to say anyway. Uh, um, it, 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 it records any decisions which are made, any sign offs which have been made, and so on and so forth. Now, if we're in a regulated environment, this might be a quite a formal record because auditors often like to look at this to see what's been achieved in that time box. And also it could be a basis for payment. And what it says on the diagram is it's, I may be wrong here, Miles, Lloyd, tell me if I'm wrong. What it says on the diagrams is a milestone product. And what it says on page 11, 111 is it's an evolutionary product. Was that what you're gonna ask me, Lloyd, or am I wrong? Yeah, I thought so. So it's another, guess what, my Lloyd, it's another glitch in the band, okay? because it could be either. Personally, I think it's an evolving product because it does evolve. It's the project note, it's the team's notebook as we go through. But it could be considered a milestone product if it has to be formally documented for auditors. Yeah, 
and they can't make up their mind in the manual, as Lloyd absolutely pointed out, well done Lloyd, uh, that 111 says it's evolution and so on. So will they ask you in the exam whether it's an evolutionary or a milestone product? And the answer is no, they won't, because they know there's a glitch in the manual. But really it evolves through the time box. It's only a milestone product if it has to be a basis for audit at the end of the time box. Nearly there, I know this is heavy stuff. This is the heaviest uh, stuff on the on the, the The other thing now is at the end of every increment, the project manager carries out a retrospective. And as the word implies, it's looking back at what was achieved in the previous increment, what went well, what was delivered, what went badly, what lessons we can learn for the next increment. It's called the project review report. It's produced incrementally. And the idea is at the end of the project, we should be able to look back over the full review of the, of the project. It should also, if we're gonna get benefits en route, describe what benefits should now realize, what should now accrue. So this is the equivalent of a kind of end of stage, end of phase report. Um, again, it doesn't actually have to be a document. It could be a presentation at a workshop. And we produce this incrementally. It's where we look back over the previous increment, document what went well, what was delivered, what didn't go so well, and how we can improve. And that's where I use the Project Coach questionnaire to, um, to uh, get us uh, making sure we're on the right track and we're learning lessons for the future. And finally, I know how disappointed you by this, um, we have the benefits assessment. OK, so the idea is when we're closing down the project, you know, when we're breaking up the band, so to speak, after the final release, it is important um, that we measure benefits going forward. And we should make sure that the mechanisms for measuring benefits are put in place at the end of the project. So we have ongoing benefits measurement through business as usual after the business has, day, uh, has after the um, uh, after the project is closed down. Now you have to think about how you're going to measure benefits. Are they going to be sales targets? Are they going to be efficiencies? Are they going to be non-financial? Like would you, how many kids have been reduced on the at risk register? Um, shortening hospital waiting times. You have to have your measures set up, but they need to go on beyond the end of the project. And this is the responsibility of the visionary. It's the visionaries responsible to make sure that we have ongoing benefits measurement in place and accountability uh, for the return on investment is with the sponsor. And that I promise you is the heaviest session of the week. I sometimes try and get some of that in before lunch, but it wasn't possible this time. And what we've done either side of lunch is look at life cycle and products. And you know, it's worth getting to grips with the idea of products if you haven't seen this before. To be honest, what you really need to understand are what the products are on pages 38 to 40. And there's a little summary of those um, uh, for each product on 38 to 40. Whew. Can I answer any questions about that? That's a heavy session. I hate that session. It's okay if you're, if you're a product project person because you understand the idea of management projects and products and so on. But if it's the first time you come across it, it confuses people. Paul's got his hand up. Tony. How can I help you, Paul? Oh, uh, um, yeah, with the, we've got the benefits assessment. Just could you remind me where the where the benefits part we're actually drawing that up i guess that's at the start of the time boxing well in your business case there should be some statement about what benefits we're looking to achieve and when we're intending to uh, to, to realize them and also we should also say how we intend to measure them so that i would suggest is an extension of the business case that's what we do that i think we're a bit light on benefits assessment in our job film for once but right from the outset you know the business case specifies the benefits but there would be a good idea to talk about when they're going to accrue, how they're going to be measured, who they're going to measure, both during and beyond the project. So again, you've got to remember, I think the manual is what? 200 and something pages long, isn't it? If you, you know, it's a framework that you, you blend with other things. 
So if you try and be precise on how you measure, who you then you end up with a book that thick, you ne definitely won't be able to open it then. Uh, so um, you know, it, it it you know, it's like it's like delivery plan. You could use a critical part diagram for that. We don't tell you how to do it. It's like stakeholder engagement. I'm sure Mariana could tell us lots of advice on how you analyze stakeholders in terms of um, their areas of power and influence, their, uh, their attitudes to the change. But we don't go into that. We just say you should make sure you understand who the stakeholders are and how you're going to engage with them. And that's in the mad. Because otherwise it becomes too prescriptive and it means that people will say, well, I, I, we don't do it like that, so I can't use Agile PM. So it's very much a framework. I always use the expression if you, if um, I know again, I'm picking on Marianne. I know Marianne is a foodie and a really good cook. You'd have to send us details of your uh, your YouTube channel or whatever, or we can see you cooking. Um, and uh, I'm guessing it's YouTube. But you know, if you have a recipe, Marianne, you know, you would possibly say sometime in your recipe, what you now have to do if you're following this rep re is recipe is take an egg and separate the yolk from the white. Yeah, that's a reasonable statement. You don't tell people how to do it, do you? You just say you should do it. And that's the kind of thing which I think frameworks do. They kind of say you should do this. It'd be a good thing to do. But actually how you do it, you can get advice from other places. And I'm sure if you get on YouTube, there's someone who will show you how to separate a yolk from a white. And I'm sure if you look at other books, there are lots of books that show you how you make your benefits and how you do Gantt charts and so on. And it's, it's important to remember this is a kind of light touch really at that point. Everyone knows how to separate the white from the yolk, surely. I don't know. You, I'm, I'm, well, I, how would you do it then? Come on, come on. How would you do it? You just crack the egg and flip it in between. Let the uh, let the white pour into the, whatever cup or container you've got. Oh, Keep but there's clever ways with suctions, aren't there? I mean, what would you do? Have you seen those clever YouTube things where you do that? What would you do, Marianne? Would you do what what uh, Lloyd says? The beans, the beans. What I'm making, I can either break it with the egg straight on the side because I break a lot of eggs. <laughs> So I've got a more experience level. No, you so know, I would just crack the egg and then I'd use the eggshell to separate. Yeah, I see. But but it depends, but there are always buts. So all the food scientists will know that depending on the freshness of the egg, as the egg gets older, that you know, the yellow tends to break easier. So these are little things. <laughs> Jeez, every day is a school day, Lord. Well, you can break it in your hand and use. There's nothing worse. Hand. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing worse than getting white though when you when you're making your uh, custard. Mm. But it is. It's uh, yes. So the idea are is, technical. Sorry, make I'm custard. You open are, pack. Sorry. <laughs> custard. Sorry, open pack. <laughs> <laughs> custard. Yeah, they're going back there. Paul, you still got your hand up. Is that from a previous question, or you've got another one? Oh no, that was from before. Okay, but yeah, you, I mean, it's important to recognise frameworks are frameworks. You work within it. There is a, there is a, there is a, a suggestion that people sort of understand, you know, what a Gantt chart is, you know, what stakeholder engagement means, and you have your own things. And that's why I say all projects are a blend, really. You know, if you've got existing stuff which works, see how you can blend it into what we're doing. That was a heavy session. Um, does does anyone need a few minutes to walk away from the screen? Meet again at three. How does that sound? Yeah. Meet again at three. Yeah, sounds good. I'm on your side. I'll lighten it up after this. Promise. What I realized then is actually you just have to be in the moment and respond as you as it's happening because I don't do I don't use any scripts, which is completely contrary to my PR stuff, because for that everything is scripted and rehearsed and whatever, edited within an inch of its life. But for my demonstrations, it's completely authentic. So it's a complete U-turn. <laughs> but, but I can now make That's food excellent. in any circumstance and I can hold my own. So it's some kind of life skill I've learned, I suppose. <laughs> and I always break eggs in it, pretty much in every demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about blind bacon in a minute, Deloitte. Do you want to talk about that? You're right. Talk about what, sorry? Blind bacon. Blind baking? Yeah. Is that like milking the cow with the no, blind no, no. Blind baker pastry. That's right, isn't it, Mariana? That's put, when you put the beans or the or the rice or the whatever in it so that it stops it rising and you pre-bake the casing and then for about five minutes take the beans out, bake it again. 
Yeah. Just soggy makes bottoms. it from getting a soggy bottom. Soggy bottoms, yeah. No soggy bottoms. So you've like you're starting something now, Lloyd. You've got us on a foodie thing. Sorry. The restaurant scene in Cardiff is getting better now as well, which is good, isn't it? I've got an aversion to change. I like going to independence for things. There's nowhere better in the UK, I don't think, for restaurants than Glasgow. Glasgow West End or Glasgow is just anywhere around there. It's amazing. Do you know the ubiqu ubiquitous chip? Yeah, I, I lived in Glasgow for two years with one of my uh, jobs in the military. Oh, right. Glasgow, Glasgow's <laughs> cool, isn't it? Edinburgh gets all the press because it's touristy, but Glasgow's a real proper city, isn't it? It's good stuff. Great food. On uh, Millionaire's Weekend, every every payday, honestly, it's um, I see Alex is laughing. The locals come out, uh, and it's just amazing. Honestly, I, I learned the lingo and everything. There were words you were talking about earlier, and there's some Scottish words that the English don't understand either, and and they're really really derogatory <laughs> towards the English. But it's just a normal word in England, you know. Like um, I'd use one for you, like fud. Fud is just like to me, it's Alma fud, but up in Glasgow, different, completely different. I'll park that, and if you want to Google it yourselves, you can, but be careful. Uh, is it like a Ned? Uh, worse than a Ned. Alex is writing it down. Look, <laughs> that is worse than a Ned. All right, all right. Uh, Ned's what we would call a chav, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do they in Glasgow? They, they, they call them uh, Ned, uh, Chad's Nevs. Yeah, I worked in Bothwell Street for quite some time in Glasgow, and uh, I used to go to Barrowlands. You know the Barrowlands Club next to the Saracens Head pub. Yeah, and uh, I, I went to see Paul Weller once because because I like Paul Weller. And I was working um, in Bothwell Street, and I said to the people, I said, let's go, let's go, Weller's playing, let's go and see where they are, you never get ticket. I said, you can always get ticket. There's always a scouser outside, <laughs> plugging them for a fiver over the top. So uh, so I went down on my own, you know, because I'm on my own quite a lot. And uh, I went for a drink in the Sally Head next door, Sally Head, Saracen's Head, you know. And I met this guy, and we started talking, and we went, we went to see Paul Weller together. <laughs> and as you went into Barrowlands, they put you through a metal detector. Like in heaven. I got the impression they were looking for knives. And I got the distinct impression if you didn't have one, they'd give you one just to equal things up, you know. And it's a great sticky ball club. We got one in Cardiff called Tramshed. I don't know if anyone goes to Tramshed. And uh, the next day I went back to the office and they said, Did you get a ticket? I said, Yeah, you always get a ticket. Just have to pay a five over the top. And they said, Did you do anything else? I said, I went in the Saracen's head. They said, My God, we don't even drive past there. We <laughs> said, It's fine. I'm going to have a drink with this fella tonight. Yeah, just take life as it comes, isn't it? Life is a and you were Welsh as well, so you got away with it. If you were English, it wouldn't be quite the same. I don't think up there. You just play it. You sometimes play. I've played that card in Belfast a few times as well. I've got it. It's easier just to say I'm just a, just I'm just a stupid Welsh guy. I don't understand that is. Ireland's weird. In in Northern Ireland, they speak like they're going to kill you. <laughs> in Southern Ireland, it's this gentle tone, isn't it? You know what I mean? Say exactly the same thing. You could be intimidated in Northern Ireland and happy in Southern. You know? I went. I was working. Um, I worked in Stormont quite a bit, and various other parts. Northern Ireland housing executive, and um, you know, again, I'm quite a social bloke. So there was a Northern Ireland were playing. Um, <laughs> were playing uh, France in a World Cup qualifier some years ago, and it was a horrible wet night. It was like watching Wales. It was a really rubbish game. I think it was nil nil. It poured down with rain. You went to Windsor Park, which was a horrible rundown ground. And I, I just realised I didn't understand the world because there were, the team played in green, yet all the fans were in red, white and blue. Um, they booed a guy, they booed a, uh, they booed a substitute who came on because he played for Glasgow Celtic. Um, they played God Save the Queen, which, you know, and there was all sorts of stuff going on. I just thought, I don't know any of this. I don't understand. I'm just going to keep quiet. That's the best thing I can do, keep quiet. That's religious tribalism in sport for you. Uh, uh, don't understand it. I mean, I can understand why you hate hate why you hate Swansea if you're from Cardiff. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's nothing wrong with that, obviously. But I mean, we not get into that. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. I tell you, sister, I used to live in Surrey, and I used to uh, work for a firm down an insurance company in the Bay, and. Uh, my habit was occasionally to drive down from Surrey, get up at half past four in the morning, five, and get down to Cardiff at eight o'clock. I had to be on site at nine. 
And um, there, are, if you, I don't know if anyone else travels around the UK, you always, you always find out where all the best greasy spoon cafes are, the best transport cafes. There's always some anywhere. And you may know this, David. There's, uh, if you go down the docks road, there's Tremorfa. And on the Tremorfa Industrial Estate, there was this greasy poo spoon cafe. And I, I was in the habit of going, uh, dropping in there for get a big fry up before I got on site, you know. And it woke me up after about two and a half hour, three hour drive. Might be there, Rachel o'clock. And you know, in those days, this is going a few years ago. I used to wear a suit and tie. I was working with an insurance company, and I was and I was the only one there who was a prat, really. Everyone else was a real person with a boiler suit on, and dungarees, and oily hands, you know. And I, I, got, I got to know the guys there quite a lot because I used to go there a couple of times a week. And I got in there one day, <clears throat> and I got in there one day, and there was there was one guy sitting down reading the sun, obviously. You know? And there was a guy behind the counter flipping flipping bacon. And uh, the, the guy reading the sun was talking to the guy flipping bacon. And I just got in and got my cup of tea in there and waiting for my breakfast. And it was a time of the Yugoslavian um, um, conflict or whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, they were talking about Milosevic, who was a war criminal. And the guy with the sun <clears throat> said that, his actual words in a Cardiff accent was, that Milosevic, he's a boy, isn't he? He's a boy, yeah. This is a war criminal, yeah. And uh, the, the guy flipping the bacon went, yeah, 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 he is, yeah, he is. And uh, the guy with the son went, you know what? And the guy behind the counter said, what? He said, I think I thinks he's worse than them jacks. And the bloke behind the counter, I could see him actually considering whether that was a reasonable proposition that a war criminal in Yugoslavia was a worse than someone who lived 30 miles up the road. And he eventually said, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> the tribalism, eh? But we get it in North Wales as well. I'll tell you what, Lloyd, you're saying about being English there and Welsh. I worked in Bangor in North Wales for a while for a council there. And... Um, <clears throat> You know, end of the day, I used to go and buy a paper. I was always staying in a and b before Premier Rooms and all that. And I went and I used to buy a paper and do the crossword and whatnot. And I, I found this little pub, which was no bigger than my, my dining room, really. And there were two blokes on bar stools and a bloke behind a counter. Now, um, I'm from Cardiff and uh, uh, I lived in Surrey a long time. I haven't really got what you call a, <clears throat> a traditional Welsh accent, I don't think. It's a Cardiff accent, which people would recognise. Um, but it's not Gavin and Stacey, you know, but people in, would recognise. So I'm in North Wales now. So I order my pint and, and uh, I sit down to do my crossword. And the two, one of the guys on the, st on the stool said to the other chap on the stool, school, loudly so I could hear, have you heard about, I can't remember now, da da David's, uh, David's daughter? And the other one said, no, what's he done? What's she done? And she said, and he said, oh, she's only gone and married an Englishman. And the other guy looked and he said, ah, could be worse. Could be a bastard from Cardiff. <laughs> and at that point, I drank my pint and went to another pub <laughs> because they were bigger than me and I didn't need the aggravation. So everyone's got their own little tribalisms going on. Eh? You get it when they go on. Like literally, they start talking Welsh and then realise I can actually understand what they're saying. And then it's just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, yeah. Yeah. Well, my um, my father-in-law was a pole, so we got lots of that. And my son-in-law is Conroe Mali, so we got loads going on in my family. But got... if you go from Bangor down the road to Carnarvon, they all hate each other, which is literally about ten minutes away. Yeah. <laughs> and then you get Chester and Wrexham and all that kind of stuff going on as well. Then. Plastic scousers. <laughs> yeah, I've only even been to Wrexham once. I thought it took a wrong turn. <laughs> Honestly, it did. I thought, why is everybody speaking in a Scouse accent? I was completely confused. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit that way, isn't it? Are we okay? That was a heavy session, that one. So um, I'm going to lighten it up again now. And we're, we're, um, you know, we're, we're moving a bit beyond foundation, to be honest, because what I don't do is just coach, coach for the exam. I want you to have something you can usefully use. <clears throat> and one of the things I've been keen to say since we met yesterday and became such good friends um, was the idea that uh, it's unreasonable, we would suggest, to expect the customer, the business representatives, to know precisely what they want from the solution up front, which is what the kind of pressure we put on them 
in what we call the traditional or the waterfall approach. You know, we said, look, you know, you have to produce a specification. So you have to produce, you know, the requirements into 100% detail. Otherwise, how can you design it? How can you build it? How can you test it? And our, our view in the agile world is that, that that's not a sensible way. What we need our clients to do, our business representatives to do, is think about, you know, some high level requirements in feasibility, which, which we call epics. Um, just enough so we can justify going into foundations. Then into foundations, document them as a prioritized requirements list. Literally just a list of requirements. I want to be able to order um, products. I want to be able to order marmalade from your website. I want to make a secure payment. Uh, I want to know what ingredients are in your, in your stuff. And then the detail emerges down here. And so the uncertainty, if you like, diminishes as you go through because we can more precise. And I've just talked about boulders, rocks and gravel. And what it means is that the detail emerges later rather than earlier. That comes up as a foundation question, by the way. Uh, when does the detail of a requirement emerge uh, in, in, D in HLPM? Later rather than earlier. So there is a certain amount of uncertainty. So the team explore the depth. So as I say, one of our requirements might be we want to be able to make a, a secure payment for our marmalade. In evolutionary development, you would explore exactly how you'd meet that requirement. You know, would you go for Agile, um, sorry, would you go for Apple Pay, Google Pay, PayPal, back system, you know, phone up and get, phone up and give your credit card number. And all that emerges down here. Whereas in the traditional approach, what you have to do is express that right up front. Yeah. So. And the other thing I was keen to say yesterday when we were talking about taking pictures of the call, that you know you really need to think about what the requirement is before you think about how you're going to meet that requirement. And it's very simple, very easy to go too, too quickly to solutions. I want the camera rather than. I want, I want the ability to take pictures, to store pictures, to work in low light conditions, uh, to work from a distance and so on. And we, we need to think about requirements before we think about solutions. And so we, we, we try to take the pressure off our client to do that and make sure that we, you know, the, de the detail of the requirement evolves or emerges through the life cycle. And then we, we design a solution to meet that requirement. And this is really one thing that, you know, the, the business analyst does. She or he is responsible for trying to tease out the requirements and write them up. And they tease them out by talking essentially to the ambassador, the advisors, the visionary. What is it you want from this solution? And then they get prioritized coming out of foundations. But of course, those priorities could change. And we, well, what we need to think about is how we will document those requirements how we will write them up, if you like, as, as a set of requirements, which are clear and, am and ambiguous. And there is a very well-known vocabulary, which is outlined um, in page, uh, uh, page 145 on chapter 19, but I wouldn't worry about it for the time being. And I've used this term a couple of times before, which they get written up as what we call user stories. User stories. And this is a well-known vocabulary, if you like, for writing up, um, writing up requirements in a business-focused way. And they're not just specific to uh, to uh, agile PM. A lot of agile, uh, a lot of agile approaches, and indeed non-agile approaches, talk about documenting your requirements as stories, user stories. I don't know if you came across that with HMRC, um, David, user stories when the way they're writing things. Yeah. It's a very well known, there's lots of advice on story writing on a book. And basically they have this, they have this format, okay? As a, okay, particular user role. Now a user role might be an individual as the owner of the business, as the head of accounts. It could be a generic group, as a customer, 
Um, it could be another system as the payroll system, could be another department as HMRC. You know, this is who I am. You can have a meaningful discussion about whether I want or I need is appropriate. Uh, I'll pick you on this, Lloyd. There's a couple of there's a couple of glitches around that again in the manual. Sometimes they use want, and sometimes they use need. It doesn't really matter. Some people say that if you don't call them needs, they don't really they, there's no real value in providing them. Other people sort of think, well, need implies it's a must. Yeah. So you know there are different ways of expressing it, but it doesn't matter. I want this requirement to be made to be delivered. Some people call them features. So as a customer, I want to be able to browse products. Um, as a head of accounts, I want to know who hasn't paid their bill. Um, as, a, um, uh, as a gold card customer, I want to see special rates and discounts. And then there should be a so that. And there should be therefore some business value from delivering the requirement. And we should always challenge, and that's why I said to Paul earlier on, Paul agreed, I think this is why you want it. You know, as a customer, I want to be able to see allergen information, uh, sorry, ingredient information on your website so that I can make sure I, I, I don't uh, order products I'm allergic to. Um, as a head of accounts, I want to know who hasn't paid their bill for 30 days so I can send reminder action. Um, as the uh, ship leader, I want to be able to know what orders are in the pipeline so I can make sure we've got the right ingredients. As a gold card customer, as a beer break customer, I want to know what discount rates are available so that I can get book a room at the right rate. And these are how you write them up. And essentially, this is saying, look, this is who I am. This is what I want. And this is why I want it. Yeah, and that's how we write them up. And the idea is, you know, that what we need to do is to get the requirements from the right people. So uh, going back to what I was saying about Mariana's role in life, understanding who the stakeholders are is really important because you need to make sure that you, you develop, you capture your requirements from all the interested parties and so on and so forth. And it's very easy to leave people out as we might see tomorrow. Yeah. And so, you know, what the, what the analyst is then responsible for is talking to the visionary, talking to the ambassador, talking to the advisor and say, you know, what is it you're looking for from this new system? What do you want it to do for you? What is it? What, what service do you want? What features are you looking for? And she or he as an analyst would then express them in this clear and unambiguous way. And, uh, you know, you get the detail from the ambassador and the advisors, you get the high level view from the visionary, and together it's a set of requirements which represent the scope of the system. And what we do before leaving foundations is we prioritize them. We say, okay, in terms of what we're trying to achieve as a vision here, which of these is a must, which of these is a should, which of these is a could, and which of these is a won't now, maybe if we get some slack later on, we'll pick it up at some time. Across the project. Not which is the most immediate need, nothing like that. Across the project, which of this, which of these are a must, which is a should, and which is a could, and which is a what? And that's what comes out of here. And this is, I'm using that word again, this is baselined as the scope of the project. In other words, we've got an agreed, approved scope coming out of here. And so the requirements are, are drawn up through interview, through discussion, through workshops, by the analyst, and this is their role really, through conversation with the business representatives. And they're called user stories, and it's a very well-known way of documenting requirements um, because it's expressed in user in, in user understood way. You know, as a customer, I want to be able to make a secure payment so that I can get food delivered. You know, that's what a customer understands. If you write it down as a sort of spec which says what you need to do is to boot up your laptop, you need to either register on the site or log in, you need to remember your password. They, they don't care about that. That's how we'll meet the requirement. That's techie stuff. That's how it'll work. We can sort that out later. 
what they want to know is I want to know ingredients information. I want to know what rooms are available at uh, VIP rates. I want, you know, that's the sort of thing. And it, it's considered to be a very good way of writing up requirements. Anyone seen these before? Anyone not seen them perhaps? It's quite a well-known way this, okay? And what I thought I'd do, I'd get you working with some. And so if I could kindly ask you to look at the Miller's case study, pages nine and 10 of the Miller's case study. Can you tell me when you've got that? And what it says at the top is prioritization exercise Miller's marmalade. And then it says requirements list for the new website, 62 days after. So we're focusing now on the website. So we'll, we, we'll take that as a, as a project, if you like, right? And what you have here are 23 requirements, which have been expressed as user stories. So each one is something that has been gathered up by the business analyst. You know, number two, uh, number one, as a customer, I want to order marmalade so I can specify what I receive. Number two, as a customer, I want to change an existing open order and so on. And there are 23 of them um, documented as, uh, as, as stories. Okay. And what I want you to imagine now in the groups I shall put you in, so we'll, we'll go into breakout now, is that these requirements have been established by the analyst through conversation with the ambassadors, the advisor, and so on, through foundations. So these have been drawn up through foundations, but they have yet to be prioritized. And the visionary has called a workshop. So she or he has, so Mr. Miller in that case, if you like, has called a workshop and he's gathered up all the, all, all the, all the participants to say, what we need to do is to remember what we're trying to achieve here, and I want you to be able to, what I want us to do is to prioritize each of those requirements as whether they're a must or should or could or have no value whatsoever. And with each requirement, we put an estimate day's effort, but I want you to ignore that for the time being. So this is, this is a workshop and the objectives are set by the owner of the workshop, which is the visionary, is to prioritize those 23 requirements so that we've got a proper PRL that we can, we can plan around and we can take into evolutionary development. So this is not about business criticality. Well, when I ask you to prioritize, I don't want you to think that's an immediate need, that's on the back burner, that's the first increment, that's not what I mean. By the time we finish the project, you know, we're looking at that overall time frame. It, in this project, which of these are a must, a should, a could, or a won't, won't have at all? Is that okay? So I want you to take those requirements and prioritize them so that when we're planning, then we can start to say, okay, that should be in the first increment, that should be in the second increment and so on. That's later, we're not bothering with that. I just want you to set priorities across the project. Does that kind of make sense? Everyone happy with that? Okay, so there are 23 to do. I'll get you, get you looking at them to start with. If you want to know more about these, they're on page 145 of the manual, but I don't think you need any more of what I'm saying. So I'm going to put you into, uh, into two groups, if I can. Again, I'll leave you for a few minutes to uh, ruminate. That's a good word, isn't it? Ruminate. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, we'll do that. And uh, I think we've lost Laura again, I think. Uh, so we'll go with that and I'll see you in a few moments, okay? Oh, we, 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 which, we, which was exercise three? We don't do them all, we bounce them around. Exercise three. What was exercise three for? We've done exercise three. No, nah, it goes from exercise two to four. Oh, I'm with you now. Just yeah, winding yeah. you up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the, you'll find this is how we said. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I'm with you now. Oh, I don't know. It's tough here. It's a tough gig, this one, I tell you. All right. So um, remembering what we're trying to do, we're trying to double sales. Have a look at those. Discuss them. I'm going to bounce in and out of the rooms and give you any more information that you need. And just decide across the whole project. So not first increment, first time blocks. 
whether you feel each one is a must or should or could or more even worth bothering with. Here we go. <laughs> First one back, David, closely followed by Susan. Alex has, Alex has slipped down the... Uh, I down lost the... the race. I even said Aracia, and then David left halfway through that sentence, so he knew what was coming. You're not saying a Welshman's cheating, are you? <laughs> Jump the gun. <laughs> I didn't hear the, I didn't hear the end of the sentence, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> totally honest. Oh, dear. Not much more to do, guys. Guys, we did well. Today's the biggest day, I think. I was, I was, they're all back now. I was just saying, Tony, that, that I, I found that almost quite ruthless and clinical. Is it, and and we we sort of had a quick discussion as a group. Is it usually, you know, almost as as quick, that that didn't for, to talk through twenty three requirements? It took us what. 15 minutes or so 20 minutes is it usually that that quick or is it actually because we've not got skin in the game when we're, we're no, not it's probably because you haven't got skin in the game i think it takes yeah. longer and it depends on the group it depends how much you analyze the requirements we'll have a talk about it now we'll, we'll chat about that but usually um that that generally takes a good half an hour good half an hour, but maybe not did yeah. you end up in the bottom third alex always <laughs> hey Lloyd, I, I've got you down as the quality man. I've got you down as because you're picking up all the glitches and all the. I, I got you down as a man who goes, "Hang on, there's a typo. There's all right." Always you, when you may hear that conversation, then by the sounds. Of <laughs> okay, so I'm thinking back. I, people often find that difficult. Um, Alex, I mentioned a good phrase, which is because you've got no skin in the game. You are not those people, are you? You are not those people. And if you were doing this for real, and it's the kind of workshop we do have, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about workshops tomorrow, which would generally be for certain, would be, I won't say for certain, but it would be generally called by the by the visionary to prioritize the requirements so that we've got a firm scope coming out of foundations. Now that may well change. We will add depth and detail down here. New requirements may well emerge, but we're always in control of the scope of the project. And if they ask you in any question, who is in control of the scope? Who is in control of the PRL? Who approves any changes to it in either exam? I promise you it's the visionary. I promise you it's the visionary. It's something we do for real. And of course, if you were doing this, and I pick on Alex's point there, if you were doing this, um, if you were picking on it, uh, doing it for real, then you would have your own vested interests. You would say, we definitely need that feedback. We definitely need net time delivery slots. We definitely need to use, you know, there's all that argument which goes on. And, and if we have that discussion, who resolves any conflicts? And it's the visionary, always the visionary. So people often find it difficult. The other thing I find, and we'll, we'll, we'll return to the Moscow uh, subject before we close tonight. People are tend, and I might, I'm not sure it happened this time, but groups tend to be very harsh on the must. Um, you know, I tend to find that people often only, only you know, they, they read the book and it kind of says, um, if you, it's not safe or legal to leave a must out. So do this or don't bother. And therefore they say, we could live without that. We could live without that. And why I end, what ends up is they end up with a very basic website. And of course, you always have to think to yourself, well, we're trying to double sales. You know, would that really double sales? So you've got to be guided by the vision. And that's why I say something along, along the lines of about 38, 12, 12 is about right, but it's only a rule of thumb. But also if you're asking your um, your sponsor to, 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 fund, to fund the project and you say, yeah, you know, we only guarantee giving you a third of the requirements to let, and you think it's going, well, that's not really value for money, mate. The other thing is, and I tried to talk to both groups about this, is we're ignoring immediacy here. If something is a must, it doesn't mean it's an immediate must. You know, it's across the whole time frame, not time box, time frame of the project. You know, but that's what I was trying to get over yesterday with the idea of the um, 
uh, the re the um, renewal function on the car insurance thing. It's definitely a must. You can't you can't you can't have a system uh, a car insurance system which doesn't allow people to renew. But when they first went live, they went live without one because there were more important there were there were other things they could derive value from. So the must became in later. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing we're driven by value. So can, can I can I ask you what what do you think about firstly before we look at what you come up with and we will do this. What do you think? about this format for just defining requirements. What, what do you think of it as a, as a vocabulary? Do you think it's, it's a good way of doing it or are you not convinced by it? What do you think? Generically. Not these specific ones, but generically. What do you think? I think it's good, but I think it also, it kind of speaks to the challenge around having specific roles because, and it's, you know, it, the point is, a certain in specific roles, you will have specific requirements because that's part of your role. Yeah. But in other roles, you won't have those requirements, which makes that kind of decision making between a must and a could and a should and a would easier. So you're we, going to think, well, as an operational head, you don't need to. Be able so you to, have to, you have to I agree with you. You have to think carefully about where you're going to get the requirements from, who you're going to engage with, and who you're not. Because you could get lots of people around the edges saying, "Oh, I want to have this," and think, "Well, they, you're not really folk. You're not really one of our key stakeholders." So we, again, I think it goes back to the idea of stakeholder engagement, getting the requirements from the right people. I think think that, and of course, there will be conflicts, and you know, someone's got to resolve them. There's one in there. One 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 requirement is I want to be able, to, as the owner of the business, I don't want checks. I want to go into the future. Checks are uh, checks are. Uh, uh, expensive to process, but the customer says, I like checks. <laughs> you got to decide, haven't you? You got to decide. You got to look at your customer base and say, hang on, how many of my customers pay by check? You know, if Tesco's are paying me a quarterly check of 200 grand, be with you now, David. You know, am I going to say to them, sorry, we got this new system, we don't take checks anymore? Right, okay. So you've got to think of the wider implications. And this is where I think the role of the analyst comes through. David, how can I help? It was just to uh, to agree with uh, Mariano, I think, and uh, also to say it would have been interesting to do that exercise, uh, you know, using or occupying the roles that we've been talking about, you know, with the analyst and uh, the visionary, and see whether or not we actually came up with the same results. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you, know, you, you have you have to put yourself in the hat in the hats there of the, of the ambassador and the visionary for that exercise. Yeah. But I mean, in, in and I, I'm picking on Alex's statement again. In the real world, of course, you 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 would have skin in the game. You would be you would be those people, and you'd fight your corner. Paul. Um, yeah, I just wanted to give an example with the checks thing. There's a a bank in Cardiff or South Wales um, called Hodge Bank. Uh, I did some projects with them, and they're their vision is to to widen their market um, by bringing digital proposition to younger people. All of their market today was 50 plus. It was all really high value pensions or savings, you know, like hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, up to millions of pounds. And almost all of them used checks. And there was not actually a facility where they could use any kind of digital transfer of money. It all had to be sent in by paper, basically. And, they'd, and they were actually looking at, okay, now we want to do this whole digital thing, um, you know, completely against potentially their current, um, their entire current customer base. Yeah, I mean, you have to understand your customer base, don't you? I mean, I went to a, I went to see a comedy gig in Newport on Saturday at the riverfront of a Welsh comedian called Mike Bubbins, and one of the uh, people doing the um, uh, doing the uh, checking the tickets kind of apologised, said, uh, "Sorry, we've got a lot of people who have printed their tickets today. They take longer to check." And I, I looked around the group that were coming in there, and I felt quite young. <laughs> yeah, and you've got to understand that, haven't you? You've got to understand what people want to do. I mean, you know, a lot of people do like it, and so you know, you have to make decisions based upon a business proposition, really. Yeah, and that's the idea. You know, contactless. You know, going to a bar now and getting you paying with a with a watch or paying with in some kind of contactless way is much better. But you will get resistance from some areas, you know. And you have to understand where where, where it's like gift wrapping. People have, I wouldn't be surprised if you said there's no value in gift wrapping. But again, if your client base is really, oh, people buy our marmalade for presents for their grandmothers for Christmas, 
maybe that's something we should include and maybe we can charge for it. So there's, yeah. So you have, a, the point I'm making is you have a further conversation. The idea of the story, they, they encourage a further conversation. They're not meant to be specifications. They encourage further, code. we call them placeholders. And, and there's a well-known model for what constitutes um, a, a good, um, well-written story on page 148 of the manual. And it, it's called the invest model. And it was pulled together by a guy called Bill Wake, who's fairly well known in my world. Oh, that's a company, com works for a company called Industrial Logic. And the invest model says, look, each story should be capable of being independently deployed. So it shouldn't say, I want to do X and Y and Z and so on, because you could deploy each one. Now, we don't have to deploy independently, but they should be capable of being so. There should be a bit an element of negotiation about them. He calls them placeholders for further conversation. And often we write them up on tickets so that we haven't got that much room because you don't want to over-egg it. You want to be able to explore it through evolutionary development. There should be some value, and all business analysts ask why. That's the key thing. Why do you want that and why do you want it now? By the time we come out of foundations, they should be able to estimate, and we'll talk about estimating tomorrow, how much effort is involved in delivering them. They should be small enough to fit into a time box. So if they're too big, then we need to deconstruct, break them down, consider them more, have further conversations, and they should be testable. They should be testable. And that's, that, that's, that's what constitutes a well-written story. And, and with that in mind, I just thought I'd walk through the ones that you've done and see what you think. And I noticed the one group, and I usually we get with, with both groups, really. There's a lot of discussion about two and three. And, and I saw the one group particularly had a lot of discussion about two and three. People often think them as the same thing. You know, number two says, as a customer, I want to change an order. And number three says, I want to remove. So why aren't they the same story? And the answer is number two's got the word open in it. You know, whereas number three hasn't. And, you know, we, 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 we tend to defer to the Amazon model here and say, you know, there comes a point where your order is open. You can add things, you can change things, you can take things out of your basket. Um, and after a while, you commit and you can't make changes. You have to rely on the, on the refund mechanism. So they are different stories, I think. Number four, gift wrapping. Mm, I don't know whether there's any value or not, really, but we'd have to understand our customer base where people buy, why people buy it, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, what else have we got here? 12 and 13. How did you read 12 and 13? People read those in different ways. Number 12 says, as a customer, I want to be able to enter a separate invoice address so I can send marmalade addresses to other than my own. So I want to say, I'll pay for it from here, and I want to be able to send marmalade to those other addresses. You know, and that, that's so we want two addresses, don't we? Customer address, uh, delivery address, invoice address. And, you know, if, if you say no to that, you just lost Morrison's, you just lost Tesco's, you just lost Waitrose. Because Waitrose don't want all the marmalade sent to Bracknell, they want it sent to the distribution hubs. But how does that vary from number 13? What do you think? Uh, number 13 is asking for a number of addresses. So you've got a, diff a number of delivery addresses like you'd have in Amazon, effectively. Yeah. Exactly so. So you can have a number of them. So they're different. But then you'd have to challenge why one is perceived to be, we'll talk about estimating tomorrow, one is perceived to be four days effort and one is perceived to be one. Um, we've got conflict in requirement, haven't we? Number 15, the owner says, you know, I don't want check payments. They're too expensive to process. And number 17 says, well, I'm a customer. I like checks. You can't have them both ways, can you really? You have to decide, you know, and should we future proof and get rid of checks? Or should we look at our existing? Now, if you're presuming that you're going to port over your existing, I presume, but I may be wrong here, they're going to port over their existing business-to-business -business database. You know, if you say to Tesco's, you know, you know, at the moment you're paying by check, we're not going to allow that in the new system. And Tesco's go, well, that doesn't fit in with our accounting practices. You've got to be, you've got to be, you've got to decide and you've got to make commercial decisions here. And this Both is companies do backs though nowadays yeah i agree i'm just yeah yeah, yeah but, I, I understand i with, mean with this know, one in particular tony would this would you say because that's a sort of a pull method because the customer wants that because it's on your list 
would you say you're probably going to have to adapt and, and work towards it? Well, I mean, otherwise you talk, you talk, you, you maybe you, you you incentivize the customer not to use checks anymore. You know, there are ways of doing that. They discounts and speed of processing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but you have to make a decision. You know, if you're going to change, if you've got existing customers working to an existing set of practices and you're changing that, how will it how will it impact upon your relationship with that customer? So there needs maybe some time needed there to do that. But you can't have conflicting requirements. Can you? You've got to go one way or the other. Some things are compliance, aren't they? You know, um, for example, uh, 20 is a compliance issue. Now, I'll be with you in a minute, Paul, GDPR. You've got to have an unsubscribe function, and that links quite nicely with number 19. You want to keep your CRM up to date? Paul, can I help you? Um, I think it probably is maybe out of the scope of the project manager stuff, but in terms of making customer stories that are there for discussion and to guide the solution rather than as a specification, if you like, which is generally how I see the developers writing them. It's a, uh, you know, it's basically saying, oh, I need to make this. And that's kind of, it's turning into a specification rather than yeah. if you are your user needs. So that's not a PM role, that would be more in the BA role. Yeah. The business analyst role is to write these up from a business perspective. And then the further conversation leads to the way the development of the detail and the solution arriving from them. Uh, yeah, and I think number 20 is a is a compliance issue. You have to be able to unsubscribe. 19 strikes me. We want to keep our CRM up to date. 21, there's a, you know, there's a whole area there. I think it's a strategic decision. We, if we've got an existing system working at the moment, which is basically business to business, are we going to keep two systems running, Joe Public and business, or are we going to put them together? If we've got a, an, a dis, um, an existing uh, tra uh, discounts um, uh, sort of set up on the existing system, how do you deal with that in the new system? So there's lots of things to think about there. Um, trade area, is that a specific area and so on? And the last one I like, you know, uh, am I going to give a choice of delivery time so that the customer can be at home to do... And again, you know, I don't think it's that, I don't think you're going to take a day off because your marmalade's coming, but you could charge for that, couldn't you? You could charge for it. But, you know, if you want a time delivery, we'll charge you a five or a throw or something. So, you know, they're not, what I'm saying is they look all right, but they're not as clear as you thought. And I think this is the skill of the analyst talking to the ambassador, talking to the advisors, talking to the vision, and clarifying it so the developers can translate it into a deployable solution. So what I'd like to do just to round this off, we're going to go back to Moscow and time boxing to finish in a day. Um, the next part of the course generally falls into chaos. I'll be honest with you. And I'll be honest, it's generally my fault. What I would like is one person. We're just going to pick on the first 13 requirements. That's all. We're not going to go any further now, just for illustration. I would like one person from each room to just tell me from requirements one to 13, whether they decided they were must, should, or could. That's all I want you to do. Must, should, or could. Or the boats. So could I have that most one? I know military people don't like volunteering, so could we, <laughs> never volunteer. Or always look after your own transport arrangements, look after your care. Yeah, I know. Um, you volunteered me already, so I'm, it's fine. Can you shout them out for me then, Mariana? One to 13. So must. Yeah. Must. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Would. Yeah. Must. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Must. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Should. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Could. Yeah. Must. Yeah. Must. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we get the same from someone from the other group, please? Yeah, I'll I'll do it. Thank you. Uh, might do it slightly differently. Uh, one is must. Yeah. Two must. Three yeah. must. Yeah. Four is could. Yeah. Five is must. Six yeah. Is six. Seven is could. Sorry, what was six? Sorry, my apologies. Six is must. Yeah. Seven is could. Yeah. Eight is must. Yeah. Uh, then it's uh so. It's Nine is uh, won't have now. Oh, okay. Uh, ten is should. Yeah. Eleven is could. Yeah. Uh, then twelve is must. And thirteen is should. 
Okay. Okay, so we've got some discrepancy, okay, which are these ones here where we have different things, but you generally got a fairly, fairly clear indication of what represents a good solution without much input from me. And if I was doing this for real across a couple of groups, I would now be looking at um, the ones where we have that discrepancy and say, okay, what, what, why, why do you think that would happen? Why couldn't we remove and say, oh, well, we are six and seven. Um, um, don't, don't we, can, are we going to keep a sort of price um, of marmalade? Are, are, people going to, are people seriously going to order marmalade without knowing the price of it? Oh, I didn't quite read it in that way. I thought it was a basket. So, you know, and what you tend to do is to clarify that. Number 17, well, I, would you not have a secure? I, I would challenge that if I was a technical coordinator. Do you think really people will buy marmalade from us without being confident it's a secure um, thing? Uh, 19, yeah, I can see the newsletter. But the ones I would challenge would be these and say, why do you see that and why do you see that? And generally what happens if you go around a couple of times, and we haven't got too much discrepancy, you get a fairly consistent view of what represents a reasonable solution. And it's that discussion which is also important. And then what we can do is, um, is take those into, uh, uh, into our delivery plan. And then we can, in our delivery plan, we can start to say, okay, what represents the immediate needs? what represents a follow-on need and so on. And that's what we do in our delivery plan. So we would allocate the stories um, to time boxes. And then like, what we would do is to say, okay, let's, that's part of the first release, those are part of the second release and so on. And, and I, I just do it with post-it notes. And what tends to happen in a real project is that these two things get done iteratively together. So firstly, you sort out your immediate your priorities, and then you start to think about what I call immediacy or business criticality. And that's the idea of it. And it's just to encourage more conversation. And as Paul says, it shouldn't turn into a speck. Ooh, so just to round off the afternoon, and we'll talk about tonight's little uh, exercise. Can I get you to look at chapter 10, which is page 50 for me, please? We're nearly at the end of the day, so thanks very much. Be busy today, haven't you? Done loads. All I want to do now is revisit what I've already talked about in many ways: the idea of Moscow and um, time boxing working together, and they do work hand in glove, hand in glove. Yeah. So this, there shouldn't be too much new now. But I know you asked me this morning about the different types of. Uh, 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 types of uh, time boxes and so on. So let's just uh, look at page 50. This is our definition of, uh, of must, shoulds, coulds, and won't haves. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now this has been kicking around. This is not new. This is, I first came across these ideas in the early 70s, obviously when I was three in school, just coming to nursery. Um, but you know, um, must are non negotiable. And the must represent, watch out for this in the exam, minimal usable subset. We guarantee the must. Shoulds and coulds, um, they're more subjective. They're more subjective. Yeah. Um, won't doesn't mean at all. Mean, won't means maybe later, maybe in another project, maybe in another increment. And we always prioritize. And there's obviously some subject subjectivity about whether something is a should or a could. But, you know, most people would see a reasonable product would be the musts and the shoulds. You know, shoulds are called shoulds for a reason. And I go back, if I can, to what we sort of suggested yesterday, you know, looking at the camera. You know, it only really needs to take pictures, doesn't it, really? But, you know, it really should store them as well. It should have a flash. It should have a zoom and so on. And that's probably a good basic solution. And that's why they're called shoulds. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, does it really matter whether they're musts or shoulds in the real world? I'm not sure they are, really, but we do guarantee the musts. And that there's more, that, but there is subjectivity over shoulds and coulds. Now, this is beyond foundation, but you'll see this diagram on page 119 of the manual. OK. And this, the reason I'm bringing this in here is, um, although it's in 119, it does come up as an exam question because we also refer to it on page 50 and so on which is that prioritization always relates to a specific time frame. 
And what they might do in the exam is try to confuse you with time box and time frame. In a project, we have three time frames. We have the overall project, which is what you've done, and you've prioritized must, should, could, won't in the project. We also take that into increments. An increment would be must, shoulds, and coulds, and a time box would be must, shoulds, and coulds. So something could be a must in the project, but a won't in the first time box or increment. Something could be a should in the project and becomes a must later on. So although we establish our key priorities in foundations, they can change. In fact, they do change as you go through, because what may well have been a could here could become a must here. So we reprioritize at the end of every increment. And particularly, we look at those, those features, those requirements which have fallen by the wayside. So watch out for that. Moscow relates to a specific time frame, and here are three time frames. I tried to describe that yesterday. And most of the prioritization is done is foundation in foundations, but it does change as the project develops. And we would say it's dangerous, really, to have more than about 60% of your effort around the must because you risk timely delivery. So we need to get people understanding why we need to prioritize and how they work. And again, it's one of the sticking blocks that I find to trying to introduce agile ways of working. I've been told this quite a few times. I, we like it, it's good, but everything is a must. It really isn't, you just think that it is, yeah? Um, but you know, we only guarantee the must. So, but shoulds are really shoulds for a reason. We don't really want the solution development team discarding shoulds, if I'm honest. Uh, and again, there's a glitch in the manual around that, which I won't, won't, won't point out. Um, the majority of prioritization is done in foundations, but priorities can change and they do change. You know, what if something falls out of a particular time box, it may well become a must later. If we get new requirements coming in, you know, when we're down here, we anticipate the new requirements will emerge. Then we go back to the PRL and say, where do they fit into our overall requirement, our overall priorities? Hopefully this is nothing new. At the end of every increment, all requirements not met are reprioritized. So we talk about having a retrospective. And you know, this is how we keep the delivery plan realistic and achievable. And that's basically what Moscow is. Yeah. Who decides? Well, essentially, in whatever it says here, it's the visionary. It's the visionary that decides whether things are must or shoulds or coulds. And what I've tried to get you thinking about is, you know, musts are non-negotiable. You should challenge musts. People will tell you that everything is a must. Um, and again, what we went over yesterday, a must can have shoulds and coulds and won'ts in it. You know, if I talked about um, selling people car insurance, we must collect their postcode. We must collect the car that they, they intend to drive. We must collect their driving history. You know, maybe you should collect how many miles they intend to drive. You could, co you could collect information about um, um, uh, optional extras and so on. So you can break things down. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. Um, a sponsor would be pretty annoyed if they didn't get all the must, but generally, they 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 they'd ex they'd be happy if they get the must or shoulds and a couple of coulds that would be good. That's probably a good solution, really. And we work on the basis that it's called the Pareto principle, that delivering eighty percent of the solution to time and budget is better than waiting forever for something which might have everything in it. Um, assigning priorities. This is our top tip. Um, <clears throat> make sure people understand why we have to prioritize and how we do it. This comes up to the practitioner exam question, the second bullet point. It sounds odd, but the idea is that when you're thinking about delivering a solution, there should always be a, a do nothing option. So one of the things they suggest is maybe starting off by saying none of these have any value at all and building up from there. And I've seen people do that usefully in workshops. Uh, with one airline I work with, they would ask their business customers, their business representatives to give them a list of requirements that they thought they would like their IT department to work on. Then they would run a workshop which was headed up by IT. This only works a couple of times, but the, the chairperson would say, well, we've looked at all your requirements. None of them have any value, so we're not gonna do any of them. <laughs> and, if you, and it would go quiet. The room would go quiet. 
and one of the business representatives would generally say, well, hang on, hang on. We need to have that. If we don't have that requirement met, we won't be able to compete with Virgin. We won't be able to compete with Ryanair. We definitely need that. And then the chair would say, OK, let's take that as a must then. Now, relative to that, are the others shoulds or coulds or musts as well. And it was a way of just teasing out what the real musts are. So watch out for that. Start Sometimes start off with everything as a won't. Um, uh, always, always, um, always challenge uh, uh, requirements. What, why do you need it? Why do you need it now? And as Paul will know, that's a that's a classic analyst question. Why? Why? Why do you need it? What are you going to do with it? Where does it lead to? Um, you've got to watch out for dependencies. I think you know beyond our JLPM, we have to watch out for dependencies. Must can't depend on shoulds, for example, because if you don't deliver the shoulds, you can't deliver the must. So you've got to watch out for dependencies and linkages. Um, requirements must be tied to objectives. And the whole idea of Moscow tied in with, time, with timing is that you don't get sidetracked on triviality. You know, we focus on the main requirements. And that's essentially chapter 10. And I try to bring that to life with what you've done. And that's closely, it's closely aligned to chapter 11, which is about time boxes. Time boxes. Um, so what do we say about time boxes? Well, what we say is they should be short enough to keep the team focused, but long enough to deliver something meaningful or useful. Yeah. So we generally say between two to four weeks is about right. That will be that comes up as a foundation question. What is the recommended length of a time box between two to four weeks? Um, what I've tried to and it is to stop people getting sidetracked. What I tried to say a couple of times is it's it's about bottom of control. If you keep the time boxes on track, the increment is on track, the project's on track. So providing we don't we respect time boxes, we should be able to guarantee a release date, guarantee a release date, guarantee the project date. And that's the idea. But it only works if you respect time boxes. And unfortunately, a lot of people still don't. So oh, you'll get you get issues like this arise in the practitioner exam. You're the project manager, the team leader has come to you and said, look, we really want to finish everything in the time box. Can we have some more time? Can we have some more money? Can we have some more people? Can we reduce? And the answer is no, you have to stick to time and budget. You have to reprioritize. You use Moscow to keep back on track. And it's a big sticking point because, you know, you need to be able to do that um, to keep on time. Um, as was said this morning, there are two types of time boxes. You'll find these on page 55 and 56. Okay, I think Dan asked me about this this morning. The ones we quite like in DSDM stroke out LPM are called structured time boxes. But there is another style of time box called a free format time boxes. But they're both, they're both bookended, if you like, by the same things. So with a structured time box, we firstly have a kickoff event where there is a negotiation, if you like, between the project manager and the team to make sure that there's clear understanding by the team of what's wanted, to make sure the team understand the priorities and that they've got the resources to realistically achieve it, realistically deliver everything. This is the kickoff event. At the end of the time, and that's true in both formats, at the end of the time box, there's a closeout. Both types of time, time boxes. The closeout has got sort of two aspects to it, really. It's got a review of what's been done. So we, we conduct, we, we review what's been actually done and achieved, and we acknowledge what's not been done. So we can feed that back into the delivery plan. So what not being done gets fed back into the delivery plan. We also look at our behaviors. There's a retrospective. In other words, we want the team to continuously improve. So we look back to say, well, how did we operate as a team? How was the dynamic? Were people as available as they said they were? Did we have all the skills we needed? Were we over optimistic? How can we adjust our behaviors? How can we learn lessons for future time boxes? So there are two aspects to the closeout. And it doesn't matter which uh, which kind of time box you use. Now we prefer, and the exams will generally focus on what we call structured time boxes, where we put some structure in between those two bookends. 
And the idea is that we, we, we want to make sure we're on the right lines. So we have an initial investigation, which shouldn't take more than 10 or 20 percent of our effort. Then we will have a review with our business ambassador. This clarifies that we are on the right lines and that we do understand what we're trying to do. And we set some, some acceptance criteria. OK, there's a discussion there. Then we go into what was not particularly well named, I think, called refinement. This is where we're actually building most of the solution. So most of our efforts, 60 to 80 percent, is spent in refinement, actually building the solution. Then when we get towards the end of that, we have another review where we can identify any loose ends, any odds and sods and so on, and we can consolidate those before the closeout. So we have an internal structure to our time box. Watch out for these words, they come up in the exams, sorry, investigation, refinement, consolidation. Yeah. And there's a table underneath the diagram on page 55, which you must take a note of, or you must tab up for the practitioner exam. They always ask you about that table. I'll, I'll refer back to these when we come to the exams uh, on, th on Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, so that's what we do. Investigation is, having a, is exploring some of the detail having a review, review, refinement is where most of the development work is done, have a review, consolidation is where we're tying up the loose ends, having a review as part of the closeout. And that's what we like. And the reason we like that is because we take the view that our business ambassador is not a full-time role. They're not available full-time. And in fact, they might not be sitting in the same office, in the same country, in the same time zone. You know, I regularly work with business and business ambassadors who are in different countries, notably uh, Lithuania. So we have to pre we have to pre pre schedule their time. We have to work around their availability and so on. Whereas a free format time box, which Dan you may recognise, is similar to Scrum Sprint, um, says, well, we'll still have the kickoff and the closeout, but in between we'll have any number of perhaps formal or informal review scheduled as we go. So there's no internal structure. Yeah. And I can see that, but it does demand that the ambassador is basically on the next desk. And you can say, can you have a look at this? Can you come and see this? Can you come and see this? So generally, given the nature of what we're doing, we tend, we tend to prefer structured time boxes. But you can use either, and a project can actually have a mix of those. It doesn't matter. The table of page 55, I've just put it into an extra slide for you so you can see what happens in the kickoff. It's all about making sure we've got a realistic um, chance of success. What happens in investigation? What happens in refinement, consolidation, and so on? But the table in 55 will be helpful. Free format time boxes, it's the equivalent of a scrum sprint. We still have the kickoff and we have the closeout. We have any number of formal or informal review points. Yeah. But it does demand, you know, it does demand that the ambassador has been available basically on a full time basis. And what we find is that's not the truth. That's not what happens. But you can use either format. And that means you can blend Scrum into what we're doing. But one of the reasons also that people who are into pre format time boxes, um, uh, don't like structured time boxes, we're going to have stand-ups anyway. You know, we are going to have daily stand-ups. And these should take place at the same time, the same place every day. Ideally, uh, everyone should attend, and ideally, everyone should attend, you know, physically. But if not, you'll see this in the practitioner exam, we're quite happy to use technology, Zoom and so on and so forth. And the team decide the time they're going to be held, where they're going to be held, and when they're going to be held. So this is the reason of this is this is for the team. These are for the team. They're not reporting to the project manager. They're for the team by the team. And it gives them a chance to replan and reorganize. So through the stand-ups, they're looking at their time box plan and adjusting what they're doing to stay on schedule. Yeah. And we usually have a burn down chart so we can see what work is outstanding and how we need to adjust. They're a very simple format. Each member of the team needs to say, this is what I've done since yesterday. This is what I'm going to do today. These are the impediments, blockers or issues which, which, which are stopping me making progress. 
And what happens is the team leader and or the project manager tries to get rid of those blockers, but not within the meeting. You know, we do say, and this comes up as a foundation question, the length of a stand-up should be um, two minutes per person plus two minutes. Scrum talks about it being 15 minutes, but that comes up as a foundation question. What is the recommended length of a stand-up? Now, there's no reason why the project manager couldn't attend the stand-up as, as an observer with the team's permission. Any of the project roles could attend with the team's permission, but only as observers. This isn't, the and, and you, it only work, that only works if you've got a culture in place where the team trusts the project manager. Because, you know, if, if you think, oh, hang on, the project manager's there, he's watching us, then it won't work. Because these are for the team by the team. And watch out in the practitioner exam, they'll, they, they'll suggest that this is a good way of reporting to the project manager. And it's not about reporting to the project manager. It's an opportunity for the team to share the current state of play and, um, and also to reorganize and replan as appropriate. And the time box plan could be updated daily. Okay. Um, by the way, don't take things too literally. You actually don't have to stand up. The only reason for standing up is to make sure it doesn't become institutionalized and doesn't take all morning. And it's the Privy Council in government that's, that stand up. They don't sit down. And that's all it means. Is an, and usually we like people to be around, around some shared information like a whiteboard. But I mean, you know, these are guides and so on. I, I promise you this is true. I did have a, um, um, a project manager phone me up. It was some time ago. Said we can't use our job here. Like, well, how can I help you? What's, what, what's, what's, what's the blocker? What's the impediment? And he said, well, we've got someone on the team who has uh, mobility issues. I went, okay, right. So, so we can't she can't do a stand-up so right okay you yeah. know it's it's not it's not that precise you know it, it's a guidance really it's not ruled so i don't want anybody being dragged out of a chair or brag you know to stand up for 17 minutes or whatever it is you know these are guides these are guides they went like oh right i thought we have to make them stand up no of course you don't that would be ridiculous and people do take things too literally and there are devices that people use to try and keep people to two minutes per person. Um, I've seen people use egg timers to try and keep people to two minutes. Um, there's someone on the web oh, on LinkedIn. He's always trying to do it. Get people. He's trying to introduce planking meetings. You know, you know, planking where you, you when you can only you can only speak when you're planking. And oh my God, that sounds ridiculous, horrendous to me. But you know, it's just a device really for keeping things short and sweet. And those are the three questions. And take a note of the timings because it comes up as a foundation exam question. Uh, that's an overly complicated diagram, which basically says, keep the time boxes on track, the increments on track, the projects on track. Um, so some top tips before we close down here. Uh, time boxing, um, believe in the time box, encourage the solution development team to finish on time by prioritization. So we should respect time boxes and never let it overrun. There's a question which comes up in the practitioner exam, which is the team are prepared to work overtime to, to complete the work of the time box. Is that acceptable? Now, in the real world, you might take a view, but theoretically, no, it's not acceptable because that's extra time and extra money because you've got to pay for the overtime and there's extra hours. And theoretically, you should encourage the team, the team to reprioritize. Make sure that we work out what's been done. Try and you know work around it. You you can't you can't allocate people around the must and shoulds. You have to try and work out what the best way of using your skill set is. Um, it's a good idea to uh, attend stand-ups as an observer, providing the team are happy with that. But that only works if they trust you, you know, and are open. People tend to cover up. You know, their transparency is important. Uh, the kickoffs important. Because there's no point not having the, 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 all the team there if the, if the expert says we're never going to get it done in time. This is all about making sure we've got realist, realistic chance of succeeding here. Um, and that's where we saw our acceptance criteria. Let the team handle their own risks. And it's important that the closeout includes a retrospective so we can learn from experience. Doesn't matter what style you use. It gives you um, it gives you confidence on to, on time. Yeah, 
And that's the idea. And if things keep dropping out of the time box, you need to think why. As part of your retrospective, why do we keep dropping shirts and coulds? Are we over optimistic? Have we not got the right team? So you improve as you go through. So last thing here. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's for the team by the team. They're not reporting to the project manager, but it's a good way of keeping in touch. Da, da, da. I think I've said all this, but I'm saying it again. I know you've had enough of me now. Uh, empowered teams. The important thing is that the solution development team must be empowered to work within the time box objectives. So they explore depth and detail and they can ditch coulds and if would need be shoulds. What they can't do is widen the scope. They can't add new musts or decide not to deliver the musts. And so it's an empowerment within the boundaries set by the project manager. If they, flink, if they can't deliver the must or something significant crops up, which they think will get, then it has to be escalated. And that gets escalated through the project manager to the appropriate individual. So that was quite quick through chapters 10 and 11, I realize that. But we've almost finished the foundation syllabus. There's a bit in chapter 12 about iterative development, where there are questions which may come up tonight. And there's a little bit in chapter nine, which is about planning and control. But other than that, we have just about done the whole foundation syllabus. And we've also started moving into uh, things beyond foundation, like requirements and user stories. So tonight would be a really good night to try that foundation paper that I sent you. So I'm hoping that everyone's got a copy of that. I think everyone said they've got it. Yeah. So my suggestion would be try it tonight. Okay. So what I sent you was a paper version of the one which is online. So if you've tried it online, you, you probably already tried it, but this is a good way of reinforcing your learning and also referring back to the manual. So I sent it to you as three documents. Firstly, um, you've got the um, you've got the uh, the question paper. Now, these aren't set by me, these aren't questions that I've set. These are set by the exam board and they're issued to accredited training organization. So whilst you won't get these exact questions tomorrow afternoon, these will be very similar to the kind of questions you're gonna get. I know not everyone, dollars, don't worry. I know you're, you're not gonna do the exam tomorrow. I don't think, are you still with that? Are you gonna come back later for the exam, Ollis? I'll, I'll work on that basis. Don't worry. Uh, um, so um, these are 50 questions, and they're all cunningly labeled A, B, C, and D. There's only one right answer to each one, and they are all facts, absolute facts. No interpretation, no what's the best thing to do, who's the most likely person. They're all facts from section one. So I would, I would suggest once you've had a break, try that exam without your manual. It's only 40 minutes, but keep an eye on your time. I think you'll finish well within the 40 minutes, if I'm honest. Um, the best way of doing it, though, I would suggest, but naturally I can't mandate, is to get the critical mass out of the way, go back to questions you've missed, go back to questions you've missed, and guess. So don't leave any questions unanswered. What I've also given you as the second document is the marking. Uh, the marking key, okay, and this gives you obviously the the, uh, the 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 right answer whether it's A, B, C, or D. So what I would suggest would be having done the paper, then mark your answers. If you've got everyone right, I should congratulate myself. Have a gin and tonic, glass of wine. Uh, pinotage is nice, Mariana. I quite like a glass of pinotage. Um, uh, or a beer or whatever, and say, well done you. But you won't get them all right, because nobody does. But So the ones you get wrong between us, we need to get them right. We need to get them right between us. So I would suggest, firstly, now that you know the answer, reread the question. And quite often, when you know the answer, and you read the question in the light of knowing the answer, you can see where you've gone wrong. For example, it's very easy to miss the word not. 
which of the following is not. Yeah. Um, usually that provides the, the, the answer. If you're still not sure why, why it's wrong, ignore the syllabus topic, but the third column here says, says section. That is, the, that is the chapter and paragraph in the manual, not syllabus area, section, where you will find that answer in the, in the manual. So check it out in the manual, and you will see that there's nothing in there beyond chapter 12. Again, that usually helps you with the answer. If you're really still not sure, I've also sent you the exam board's rationale document. The rationale tries to explain why the answer is what it is. Personally, I think the rationale is a bit geeky. I think it sometimes says because the book says so, which is not helpful, but that may well help. If after having done all that lot, <laughs> you're still not sure why the answer is what it is, just forget about it. Just forget about it and don't worry about it. But when we meet tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, we will start with a debrief. We'll start with a debrief. And what I will do is I'll walk through all the questions with you. You will do the whole paper. We'll walk through them all. I'll focus on the questions which you, are, which you don't understand the answer to. So you can shout out, well, we're not quite sure what happened with number 12. We don't get number 12. Can you tell me about why that's what it is? I'll try and point out all the key words I know, and I'll try and explain in common sense why the answer is what it is. And that, that should resolve all, 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 all your questions. And as I say, we've covered everything. If you've got a chance to look at chapter 12 tonight, there's a bit of our iterative development in there, which comes up. Um, and there's a little bit in chapter nine. We've done, we've done mostly apart from that. Yeah, and we'll do a debrief. And that, help, that should help clarify and give you some confidence as to why the ones you got wrong were wrong. And that's going to be how we're going to start the morning. So tomorrow morning is the time for doing that. So I'm hoping everyone's happy to have a go at that tonight, if you could. Um, that would be marvellous. Um, if I could also ask you tomorrow morning if you could bring some photo, photo ID along. Um, the exam board are paranoid about serial exam takers. I don't know if you can do this with chat GVT now. That'd be quite good, wouldn't it? Uh, but um, yeah, I need to sign things off to demonstrate that I checked some photo ID. So if you wouldn't mind bringing that along to start in the morning, and I can check it. It won't take a few minutes. So, you know, I'm sure you're not a serial exam taker, but just maybe a driving license or a military um, ID card or passport, anything with a photo and a name, so that I can sign off what I've seen to demonstrate you are who you say you are. And uh, that's the objective tonight. I'll send you a little email like I did last night just to clarify what we've done and what I think you should do. But the main thing to doubt is keep up to speed with what we've covered. You know, in, you know I think the heavier section was chapter six and chapter eight. Um, but try that paper. Try that paper. And hopefully that will build your confidence, especially after tomorrow's debrief for tomorrow afternoon. And we're done. Can I just ask a question? What's what do you mean by D or what is meant by decomposed? Uh, oh, yeah. So a requirement could be decomposed into smaller, smaller areas. So I want to be able to provide an insurance quote for car insurance. You could depose that into saying, well, we within that, within that must, um, we could collect mileage, we should collect um, the color of the car. You know, um, so you can decompose things into different areas. So maybe we'll talk more about that if you think when we come, we're going to come back to user stories tomorrow. So you can decompose things into smaller units. And just the other thing, just in terms of the time allocation, you know, in terms of we talked about 60 to 80 percent or, you know, 60 percent effort, 20 percent effort, 60 percent on must and 20 percent on could, Rule and 10 percent contingency. What, what happens to should and won't? Oh, well, won'ts, won'ts don't have any time to them, do they? Okay. So, yeah. And if you, you're looking at the diagram on page 119, is that the one you're looking at? Well, I don't know. I just, this is just from my notes. I just, I just wrote right. this down and I thought, well, okay. We work on the basis. We work on the basis. Yeah. There's a kind of rule of thumb that if you're promising to deliver, absolutely guaranteed to deliver more than about 60% of the solution at that point, then you risk timely delivery. So mm -hmm. there shouldn't really be... No, no time box, no increment, no project should be should have more than about 60% of your effort around the must. And then we say, 
you know, 20% of your effort is probably going to be the coulds, the nice to haves and all that kind of stuff. So the should slot in between the two, really. Okay. Right. Because a reasonable solution, it goes back to what I was saying about the camera, really. A reasonable, reasonable camera, you know, would be one that takes pictures, stores pictures, got a flash, got autofocus, it's got a screen and a battery. And those are, those are kind of what you're looking for because the musts are very, very basic. These things would be great if we could have some of those, but hey, so it's that kind of thinking. But deconstructing means we can break things down into more detail. I'll, I'll look at more of that tomorrow, if you will. Whew. Any more questions before we drop? Is it okay? Photo ID okay first thing in the morning? And we'll sort that out well. When we've done the debrief, we'll get that out of the way. That enables me to activate your exams. And by the time then, tomorrow afternoon, I will have activated your exams for you. So um, you can just, we can just sit them all at the same time and get them out, or get the foundation out of the way. So you will find the exam sort of platform is very simple. It's very simple. You just log on to the candidate portal. I'm, I'm presuming that you've all created um, an, an entry on, uh, on the Agile, on, on the APMG's website. Is that right? On the APMG system? You responded to their um, request. I haven't checked, to be honest. I've been busy. I usually do, but I haven't this time. And all you do is to log on to your candidate portal. Your exam will have been activated, and you just click your way through 50 questions. You can, you can leave questions to go back to. You can flag questions. You can change your mind. I know who you are, Susan. It's all right. Uh, if I've met you before, you don't need to show me any photo idea. I was just about to say that. I'll add some um, some feedback on the last exam back up to the um, to the developers of the actual website of the test. And sorry, Alexa's talking. I just unplug her. <laughs> and basically, uh, on the actual test exams on the questions, I'm just going on the on the practice exam now. You've got to scroll down to see the actual answers. And over fifty questions, that's a valuable waste of. I think it worked out it was probably about four seconds per question. Times by the, sample, the, the, the sample one, yeah? That, no, that was actually on the exam as well, of the scrim exam. And um, I was trying to pass it back up, basically, it's just a valuable waste of time. But they looked at it and he said, they basically, the feedback was that um, it wasn't viable waste of time. Whereas if you're doing 50 questions in 40 minutes, it is. Because if, if uh, some, of the, some of the guys did the, the test tonight, you see you've got to scroll down to actually get the, physically see the answers. But does as I recall, I haven't looked at it for a while. The way they've got it, mm. you've got the question, you've got the you've got the A B C D alongside it. Have you not? No, it's below it. Oh, it's below it, is it? Okay. Yes, yeah, so you've got you've got your test, and then you've got the exam, and the answers are below it. So you've physically got to scroll instead of everything being on one page, as it should be. You've pretty much got to scroll to get the answers, which is it's it's not very but it's not very user friendly, and they've not changed it. And oh, okay. I, still, I still think it's not fair. If you look at the sample online, I don't think it looks like that, but I may be wrong because I haven't seen it for a while because I, because I don't need to really see it on this. But, uh, yeah. yeah. I've been sample... using Safari and the sample online is the same thing. You have, a, you have a little scroll to do, but it might be because it seems that um, I've got to download Google. It might be that if you try it on the Google, um, whatever page it is, web page yeah. on, um, Safari or something. Yeah, maybe Safari. give it a go. Oh, on Firefox, you don't have to scroll. I, I did the foundation thing last week or... Hmm sometime over the weekend and, and I didn't have to scroll for the answer. I, I remember when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I last did one of their exams, which was a while ago now, I have to admit I do, so I have to do different exams to you guys. Um, I don't remember having to scroll, I must admit, but maybe it's a browser thing, I don't know. Maybe it's a browser, I'll have a look tonight. Well, Susan, how can I help you? I've only got the one screen, will that affect my um, timings for the exam? You've only got the one screen? Yeah. No, I don't think it will. I don't think it will. I, I, I must admit, I haven't had anyone with either, with either, first I've heard of that one, but I, I haven't had anyone with either um, exam finding that to be an issue about the way in which they, they actually answer the questions, I've got to say. Okay. But of course, you won't be sitting foundation tomorrow? No. <laughs> I'll be um, revising. But we need you to come back in after. Yeah. Again. Okay, 
Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't know about that. I, I honestly don't remember that being an issue, I and mean, no one's ever raised that to me before, Dan. I've got to say, but I mean, if you yeah, maybe it's my browser. I'll have a look later. Anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I always remember it being pretty sort of pretty sort of simple. It was just there, and yeah, you know, I didn't have to. I don't. I didn't have to scroll down to do with that. Definitely not. But I can't. You know, I'm not techie, so it's a long time since I actually did that. Whew, any more questions? You had enough for me there? I can ask any questions you like. I read the book last night. I got the end of it. Do we get this 20 minutes back tomorrow? This 20 minutes that we've overrun tonight, you mean? Yeah, no, you're buggered now. The technical too. Take, take it on Friday. It's fine. If anyone's working in a second language, they get 25% dispensation. Huh? But we've had, we have to, with this exam, we have to apply for that up front. So you all look like you know English to me, so we should be all right. If they, unless you talk to Cardiff, David, what do you reckon? Right, I'm glad you're Me no have English. Automatic dispensation for being Cardiff. Yeah. 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 Right, okay? yeah. yeah. Oh, God. Hardest language in the world to learn. Right, we're done. So um, good luck tonight. I'll send you a little email like I did last night. Try the practice paper. That's the thing tonight. Um, there is only one right answer. But well, we'll do a we'll do a sensible debrief in the morning. I'll explain and show you all the key words you need, and your confidence will grow and grow and grow. I hope. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. 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 Well, Alex, are you okay? So um, uh, Tony, you're not doing the exam tomorrow, Alex, are you? I've got... I, I, I exam uh, exam tomorrow because uh, it's really something unbelievable for me. Uh, I need a lot, a lot of time to understand everything, especially the lexic, right. professional lexic. It's very unusual for me. Uh, the question is, I spoke today with Karim uh, and uh, he told me uh, to get exams in June. Uh, it will be the same procedure as uh, tomorrow, but uh, uh, I will I will make I will make my exams in the same day like this group that will uh, have uh, tutoring yeah. in in June. Yes. So what happens in June? We run the same course, and you will join in with. Um, you can sit in as much as you like, but you will join in and do the exam on the Wednesday afternoon and then on Thursday afternoon in June. I think it's June the 4th and 5th, is it? Something like this? Um, like, like this one. And uh, is there the same restriction uh, and requirements as for a Prince tour, the special program, special tool no, set? No, you don't have to do any of that. No downloading of AMP exam shield, nothing like that. It's, and and the, the, the supervisor is me. It's more, more relaxed. More relaxed, but uh, I try to do this uh, past papers that you send. Uh, you, you need, you really need to know language uh, specialities yeah. because you need to understand this whole whole sentence, and uh, I need the time. But yeah, you need time. That's okay. Well, you, I mean, Karim has given you the time, I think. So, when what I want you to do tomorrow, when the others do the exam, just take a break, uh -huh. uh, and we see you after the exam, so we can work on the practitioner, and then. Okay. Um, same Thursday, you don't need to stay Thursday afternoon because there's nothing to do after the exam. So you can finish Thursday, let's say when we finish, when the, when the others start the exam on Thursday, you, you, can leave the, you can leave the group and then I'll see, we can sort you out. We'll, we'll work again in, in June. Okay, thank you very much. I'm very, very sorry to disturb you on the question. Thank no, you. it's no problem. It's very hard for you guys. I'm always impressed that you can, it's no, it's, uh, it's hugely impressive that you're able to participate. I think it's not easy. This and the language is not easy. Uh, you know, but I have uh, a little a little practice in Cardiff University in project management uh, because I apply for a short time courses for that learning, mm. and but it's not relevant to that uh, information to that material that you present here. It's just the basis. What is project management and how to involve in this profession? But the, the it's really tough courses you have. Yeah, yeah. This is not as tough, I don't think, as Prince too, but it's still a lot of words. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank Have you, Alex. Appreciate Have all your hard work. I know it's not easy. You're doing really well, I promise you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Friendly, no? No, thank you. Take care. Okay.
Morning, everyone. Morning. Anyone else got snow? Morning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All the places we'd rather be this morning, I wonder. <laughs> I thought we were just friends. <laughs> <laughs> we are, but this is a snow day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not as good if you're, in, if you're in mountains and it's fun. It's not quite as good when you've got to get around, is it? It's sticking in the garden, but isn't the roads to clear? It's not sticking to the tarmac. Uh, where I am, it's uh, it's heavy, it's snowing quite heavily at this moment. I should out the window. Yeah, the roads are okay. You're right. It'll be gone. It'll be gone. <clears throat> it's all those heated roads you get in Cardiff, isn't it? The I rest of us pay for with our council tax. Paved with gold. Paved with gold. Heated roads. Yeah. I mean, you know. Yeah, my estate is 30 years old and the roads still haven't been adopted by the council yet, so... Really? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had that problem with our house for about 10 years. It was a new estate and uh, the builders went bust just after they built the houses. And um, they didn't they didn't finish all the uh, paperwork with the council, so it was a huge thing. And of course, anyone trying to sell their house then got it. It was really difficult for them. A couple of people still to come, so we'll just give a minute or two. On the vodka there, uh, Courtney, I think that's not a bad idea to start the morning. 